like to call the order of the workshop of October 19th, 2020. Uh, before we jump into the agenda, I'd like to turn it over to the city manager just for a quick protocol announcement. So as you see, we've set some things up a little differently in here. This, uh, this um, council chambers will be for council um, staff. We have the community room set up for uh, public uh, participation. The podium is now in the council in the community room. Uh, when a public uh, participation happens, you'll see it come across the screen. They now have the screen set up in there, just as Brian's showing here. Uh, so they'll just come in and speak right there, uh, rather than bringing people in. Part of the uh, phase four of the reopening did uh, have some other changes regarding uh, municipal buildings. And so these accommodations are to meet those requirements. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Now I'd like to turn this over to Karen Scammon and Joe St. Pierre, which will be presenting tonight an assessment update. Hi, good evening, Mayor, City Council, Manager Kroll. Uh, I'm Karen Scammon, Assessor for the City of Auburn. And I'm Joe St. Pierre, Deputy Assessor. And we're here tonight. Um, you have been given some statistic packets that we do every year and we're here tonight to present just a portion we're just going to do a quick overview of what's in that book um, not all of what's in there but we're going to hit the highlights of what's in there um, just to allow you time to maybe ask questions or understand what you're looking at when you're reading it um, we prepare these every year um, not exactly the same. We switch up the statistics that are in there. Some of the things are the same, such as the municipal valuation um, report, but we do add different things or change them up a little bit. Um, we hand them out to the manager's office, the finance director, the council gets them, as well as the mayor each year. Um, we hope that you take time to look at them. They provide a lot of good information, interesting information. Um, and with that, Joe is going to, he has put together a PowerPoint presentation and we will begin. Um, so like Karen said, um, these are our commitment numbers. It's basically an overview and there is a great deal more detail in your uh, packets. So we really encourage you to look at those. And if you ever have any questions, you can call us in the assessing office and would be happy to explain things to you. Um, so the commitment date this year was July 28th, 2020. That shouldn't be confused with the assessment date, which is always April 1 of every year. The assessment date is effectively what existed on, on that day is what we assess for any given year. So if something was built after that date, so you put a garage on there, uh, maybe uh, a week later, that doesn't get assessed until the following year. Sometimes that's a point of confusion for people. So the abatement deadline is always six months after the commitment date. This year that means it's January 29th, 2021. The city of Auburn has a 100% certified ratio. Uh, that ratio is, is determined by the uh, state of Maine. We send them some sales information for a sales ratio study. We're presently at 100%. Not all communities in Maine can say that. Uh, the mill rate remained flat this year at 23.75. The value of a homestead, which we're going to talk about in, in more detail later on, was $25,000. In terms of tax dollars, uh, that's $593.75, uh, $593.75. Um, if our certified ratio were something different, let's say it were 70%, that would actually be lower because it would be, it's multiplied by the... Uh, by the homestead value um, and the mill rate and then adjusted to the certified ratio. So some commitment facts. Um, the total city valuation, that means all property in the city of Auburn before exemptions was $2,647,215,142. Those last two dollars were the hardest to come up with. Um, we have $339 million in personal property and $2.3 billion in real estate. So we have 1,078 personal property counts. These are businesses that report and file uh, personal property. We have 9,395 real estate, 9,395 real estate parcels, 
that, that varies year to year. If there are splits and merges, uh, that number can change. Like, for in instance, a subdivision would uh, change the number of parcels that we have. And of course, um, this includes all the exempt property. So the total valuation in the city increased $26,776,036 compared to 2019. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later as well. Our taxable value is $1.9 billion. How does that break down? Well, in personal property, uh, the total uh, assessed is $339,910,000 uh, minus um, exempt. And you'll, you'll notice that our exempt personal property is a great deal higher um, um, than the taxable value at $224 million, leaving a taxable value of $115 million. In real estate, um, our total valuation before exemptions is $2.3 billion, and exemptions totaling $465,976,000. So our taxable is $1.8 uh, billion in real estate. Very simply, you add those together, that is our basis for our, our taxable valu valuation in the city of Auburn. Um, you know, one thing, we, one point we want to get across very clearly is the influence of exemptions on um, our city valuation. The, the value, if you, there's a, this is a trend line going from 2007 to present, and you'll notice that the trend uh, before exemptions is upward. Um, we're, we're actually increasing and have been steadily over, over time. Um, I, I started this trend line in 2007 because something notable happened in, in 2007, which was uh, the, the Betty exemption uh, was, was implemented that year. And there's also been some significant changes to uh, the homestead, which I'm going to talk about more. But, but overall, uh, the property value is increasing in the city of Auburn. But if you look at the taxable value, there's kind of an inverse relationship where it's decreasing because of the value of exemptions. Um, so. It's, it's increased, that gulf has, has increased um, 327 million since 2007. If we look at our ratio, um, exempt to taxable, more than a quarter of the, more of the quarter of the valuation is exempt. So 26% is exempt uh, with a total taxable valuation of 74% of the overall um, valuation. So exem exemptions are quite significant. We have um, 5,515 individual exemptions and those are for such things as um, the homestead exemptions, um, city exemptions, benevolent and charitable organizations, education, things of that nature. Your packet breaks these down in great detail. Actually we have all categories listed so you can see how many we have and what the value of those various exemptions are. Um, so the, the, the value of those ex uh, real estate exemptions is 465 million. So one, one category that's particularly interesting is the homestead exemption and it's really evolved over time. Um, this year was raised from $20,000 to 25,000 in 2020. That's a significant increase. And we can look that it's, it's significantly increased quite a bit since 2015. In 2015, the value of the homestead was $10,000. In 2016, it was 15. And 2017, it went from, it went to $20,000, where it remained until this year when it was $25,000. So it increased, if you look, if you sum those up, uh, last year homesteads were worth 89 million, this year they're worth 111 million. That's a $22 million increase uh, in, in homestead exemptions. And the total number of homesteads that we have this year was 4,501 uh, residents or eligible residents have a homestead exemption. So that's those kind of sum up some of the real estate uh, exemptions. We also have exemptions in personal property. <clears throat> and these are programs that are available to businesses. Uh, the, Betty is the only true exemption, the business equipment tax exemption. 
but there, there's also some other relief. Um, so Betty, um, our assets that are, that are uh, by statute um, exempt. So a business can say, well, the, these assets meet the criteria, so uh, they're fully exempt. They have to present an application to the assessing office, and generally speaking, if they meet the criteria, it's going to be approved. There's a few exemptions. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the bullet points, but it's a program available. Um, there are other relief. Uh, for, for those assets that don't qualify Betty, they may qualify for uh, a reimbursement, uh, the Business Equipment Tax Reimbursement Program. So that is actually, after taxes have been paid, um, the, the, the taxpayer will file an application for better, uh, and the state reimburses them on those assets. Uh, obviously, it's not as uh, attractive as being fully exempt like those assets in the Betty program, but uh, relief is available for most personal property assets. So personal property has uh, changed considerably over time. And let's start with taxable. Uh, since 2015, there's kind of a declining trend on what we have as taxable. There's a few reasons for this. Um, over time, more assets become eligible for Betty which means that there are fewer taxable assets in the pool. Um, since a lot of these assets tend to be older, uh, there's depreciation applied to them, which also decreases the value over time. There's kind of an inverse relationship when we look at assets that are Betty eligible. And again, uh, the trend line is generally up, although there, there's a few peaks and valleys there. Um, well, some of our large industrials may uh, present a, lot, a, a, a big amount of uh, uh, Betty assets that in you know that may spike the the numbers a little bit, and then this year are kind of dipped again a little bit again. So um, when we when when we talk about changes to value, um, what's driving that? So we hear a lot about permits and and value changes, um, you, you know, from from growth and we hope to capture as much as that we can. It doesn't necessarily tra transfer dollar to dollar, but we had $38 million in value increases on the real estate side. These are due to things such as new construction, renovations, additions, um, outbuildings, decks, yard items, uh, even the small things add up and we do inspect those properties. Um, land changes, to a lesser extent, if you have a, a, a subdivision or splits, that, can, that will also increase. Um, Obviously, there's a converse to that. There are de decreases due to other things, such as demolitions. Um, we maybe re we reassess a property, and we discover the condition isn't as good as we thought it was, uh, things of that nature, and other types of losses. We had um, uh, $5.7 million, $5 million in losses, uh, such losses, uh, in 2020. So the net increase in real estate was $32 million. The next slide is <clears throat> who are the top taxpayers in the city of Auburn. Um, the, the list hasn't changed much in the last few years, although the, sometimes there's some movement up or down. Um, and this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we determine their ranking in that based on the sum of their real estate and personal property, if they have any. And then we talked about the tax base mix, again, fairly, um, fairly self-explanatory. This is taxable, um, and the percentage, uh, you know, who, who pays what. In some communities, uh, industrial and commercial is uh, together. Uh, we, we parse them out. Commercial and industrial are, um, you know, 23 and 10% respectively. Personal property makes up 6%. Utilities, vacant land, uh, the remainder, but the lion's share is uh, residential. And here's some information that we've been collecting since 2015, and I think it's been of some interest. Um, when, when we have a, um, a sale of a residential property, and commercial properties as well, but it's a different survey that we do, um, we, send out res we send out surveys to property owners, to new property owners, asking them um, why they purchased property. And actually, it's, it's, um, there's, a, there's a letter 
in a form that should be loose in your packet with the questions that we ask. Mostly it's sales, we're, we're, we're trying to ver verify the terms of the sale and we ask specific questions uh, about that. But we also ask, why did they buy the property? And there are some canned responses. Um, and the number one reason why people are saying, the respondents are saying that they uh, are buying this neighborhood. It's, it's a pretty, pretty uh, wide margin. 88 respondents say that that's the reason why. Price and condition are uh, kind of a, a distant second, and then uh, proximity to work is another one. Um, the other reasons, and these are also all in your packet, it's not in this, the presentation, are usually some variation of neighborhood. They wanted to be close to family or, um, uh, you know, there's a variety of reasons there. But again, neighborhood is, um, it's kind of a wide uh, category, but it's the number one reason people for, uh, for purchase that people cite. And the last thing, uh, th there's an MVR in your packet. The MVR is the municipal valuation return. It's kind of an overview of um, uh, different statistics that we send to the state that they ask for about exemptions, about value, um, and um, it's, it's a 10-page report. Um, it's a detailed overview of the city valuation exemptions and the valuation base. It's a pretty important document because it's the basis that the state uses for determining reimbursement, revenue sharing, and how we rank in the state valuation. It's quite a labor-intensive project. I wish we had a button we could press and all these numbers popped out, but uh, no such button exists, and it's included in your packet. That is uh, an overview of our 2020 uh, valuation statistics, statistics. If you have any questions, we'd be delighted to answer. Uh, I'm sure there will be some questions. So just to a note to the council, we do, this is extremely timely, and every year I enjoy seeing this, and I enjoy the differences and, you know, and really the insight here. Um, it's timely because we're going to have a retreat, and one of the major components of that retreat is to talk about our tax base and what we're doing in order to increase valuation. So this data, thank you, is great. Uh, we'll also have more time to to discuss and debate tax mill rates and so forth at meetings and priorities but let's use this time if we could are there any clarifying questions that we might need to hear from our assessing department on this especially for counselors who are fairly new but counselors on you just quickly the city of Auburn residential sales verification survey it can provides a lot of rich data is it possible to dig into this a little bit more or add to it um, well, I, again, it's, it's a tool that we use to um, verify sales information. So a lot of the questions are about price and, and you know, special circumstances regarding to the sale. Um, it's, it, it, I would love to do that, and it, it, it would be kind of a, a project that we would um, uh, really like to have the time to, 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 to do. Um, the, uh, it's, uh, there's a few cautions on it. You know, we send these out to property owners. We don't get a great response. You know, we, we get an adequate response. I think it tells a, a story, and there there's some good data to, to glean from it. Um, I, I, we've imagined scenarios where we redesigned it so that there was information that, that they could uh, respond to online. We don't know if that would improve the responses, um, but. Yeah, I, I mean, I would love to see us dig into it a little bit more and, and expand it, um, but we can't force people to participate either. And you, there's a point of diminishing returns. The longer it gets, the less response may be. Right, true. I'm just thinking, you know, you could look at neighborhoods. When they say the neighborhood, you could cross-reference. But, but that's, I know I appreciate the time. I just think it's some, you know, it's worth when we're, what we're talking about to think of an instrument like this and maybe some kind of incentive for people to fill that, it out. There's also something to be said about doing a six month or 12 month follow up to all respondents because there are your chances of higher uh, responding and looking at some of the data points there. Did Auburn meet up to your expectations? Was your, you know, the reality as good as your vision was and so forth, but put that down. Let's talk about that during the retreat if we could as well, because that is rich data. So thank you very much. Any other questions on this? It's a lot of good data though. Well presented. Thank you. Um, if we, 
everything that you presented, I believe, in your PowerPoint is also inside of the packet. So all the slides, there's no additional slides that you might have presented that would not, that is just a consolidation of information within the packet? The slides are actually, um, there's quite a bit more. It, I mean, it, it's, it's basically a PowerPoint presentation. We edited it quite a, quite a lot, so to condense it for, for a presentation. But it's all right so here. But it's all is in, in there. Okay, yeah. great. Good. I just want to make sure we had all the data. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you next year. <laughs> Maybe sooner. Thank you. Maybe sooner. Um, thank you. Next, we have a presentation. Um, with regards to the uh, Tot Lot and Municipal Beach, or Lake Grove Beach, I'm sorry, with Sabrina Best and the chair of our Recreation Committee, and that's Michelle, Melissa Pratt. Say, so close. Misty Edgecombe. Misty you were Edgecombe. almost there. You I had like, the yeah, right I'm, it's the letters. I'm getting in reverse. Oh, Misty, okay. thank you very much for being here tonight. And I saw you at the outlet on Sunday, yeah. which yeah, was great. taking some of the pictures that I needed. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you all, and thank you very much for coming. So the Parks and Rec Advisory Board um, for quite a few years have been talking about uh, these two parks specifically, the Tot Lot and Municipal Beach. Um, and so we've come to the point where they're going to put forward some recommendations uh, that's not just their own. They've outreached without the, throughout the community and um, would like to see some improvements with both of these parks um, that Misty will go through. Hi hey everyone, again, my name is Misty Edgecombe and I'm the chair of the Parks and Recreation Board of Advisory. So I've got some pictures and we're not gonna go through every single thing that's on here, but um, to get some visuals. So show of hands, how many people have been to both of these parks? Almost everybody. Okay, so if you haven't been to one of these parks, go take a look, they're both fabulous parks. They're really great to see. All right, so is it just a space bar to change it? Yeah. All right, just normal. All right, so here's your board. We have a bunch of people all from the city and we all really enjoy doing what we do. All right, so this is kind of our task to determine what the future holds for both. What are these parks doing well? What could they be doing? What do they need? We're gonna start off with Municipal Beach. So this is, this is a really great park. It, it also has maybe three or four names. Um, so not in our packet, but what would be great if it had one solid name that when you put in your GPS, it could take you right there. Um, having a few names makes it challenging when you're trying to direct GPS. Um, so it stopped being a beach in 2013. Um, but if you've been in Auburn for any length of time and you were a kid, you probably swam at this beach. This be beach has been open for dec or was open for decades before it had to close. It had to close because of high bacteria levels. Um, and currently it's just a great park with really beautiful natural space. Picnicking areas with covers over the picnic tables, some playground equipment. So the picnic areas that we have at at Municipal Beach. Um, it's got some great uh, covers over it that are in really great shape. The gazebo that you guys see is probably the one that needs the most work there. Um, the posts for the gazebo go all the way down to the cement pad, which means that when there's moisture there, there's gonna be a little bit of rotting. The other structures weren't built that way. They were built up on little levels. So the only one that needs a little bit of love there is that one. Um, but the snack shack and the bathrooms are in fantastic shape. They're both unused, but they are there and ready to be used. Um, the fact that this park has working bathrooms is huge. The fact that they're not used ever is sad. Um, as a parent of children who hate porta potties more than anything else in the world, it would be so nice to have flush toilets that work. So the big part about this is that it used to be a beach and there are so many people who would love to see it be a beach again and we are part of that group. Um, so we have some plan A, plan B, and then if all else fails. So the beach was closed because of high bacteria levels. So the bacteria levels have to be addressed if we ever hope to open this as a beach again. So whether or not that just means some simple aeration in the water to lower those bacteria levels or if it's gonna be something that's more intensive that's really going to be out of our budget. Um, but to figure that out, how much would it cost? Would it be simple aeration to bring those bacteria levels down or would it be more? So if it's an easy fix, then we recommend that it be reopened. We would need maybe some changing areas, an outdoor shower, some little sand. But other than that, the beach doesn't need a whole lot. 
Uh, plan B, if the water cannot be deemed safe for swimming, if we can't bring those bacteria levels down, then we would really like to see if maybe a fountain or some simple aeration could bring the bacteria levels low enough so that we could recreate on the water. And then we were thinking maybe kayak lessons for kids, paddleboard yoga, having some paddle boats out there, still getting people on the water. Um, it's not lost to us that we have two full lakes in the city and no place to swim that's a public beach. That's a little bit sad and we would really like to address that. So if we can't swim here, is there another place in the city that we could have as a public beach? Is there another spot? Um, is there anywhere on Taylor Pond that we could have for a public beach? So we would really like to figure out a beach for the people that live here. Um, and if all else fails, this park is great as is. It's a fantastic standalone park. It's really solid. People use it all the time. Um, people are always having birthday parties there or bringing pick up, you know, soccer games. The playground there is in great shape as well. Um, it needs maybe one or two more pieces to kind of round out the play offerings. The slide is a little bit old and rusty. Um, that could stand to be replaced. There's also a basketball court here that gets used a lot, but it's in disrepair. It needs to be rehabilitated. And that's all I have for the public beach. Do you guys have any questions regarding that before we go forward with Tata? Um, I, I'm not sure if we should wait at the end, but I'm just curious if they, there's part of the consideration that this be, the water is actually part of Lake Auburn, and if the RFP committee has included that as part of the consideration in terms of the research. No, not yeah. specifically. <clears throat> yeah, it's the outlet, so it doesn't backflow back. It's connected to the lake, though. But it's an outlet. It goes there's out. No, yeah, it only, the water only flows right, the in water one direction. Current, yeah. So there's no consideration in terms of when they're looking at Lake Auburn to include this as part of that? I, I well, think there should be, though. There should be because uh, the water level and the water flow could mean a difference, and it could uh, affect the uh, aeration or aeration, area, whatever we want to call it. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so I really think that they should be looking at some of that so we have some answers. So at your next meeting, you'll have the RFP before you, and as a council, you can make amendments to that before it goes out. Thank you. Yeah. And not to be nitpicky, it's just, to your point, yes, it's part of the lake, but I think what we have to realize is the mission statement for the initial RFP was centralized around one thing, and that's what the subcommittee was tasked to do. But to the manager's point, if we want to amend that as a council, we can. So. I got a quick one. Uh, is the Parks and Rec uh, done anything? I was talking to uh, the water department today, and part of their work that they do with the lake is that they have a grant from the USDA to uh, for the foul uh, mediation remediation to keep the foul off. And if I'm not, if my memory serves me, or it's been 37 years or so. Uh, that was the problem at the outlet is the ducks and the geese were out there. Yeah, it was part uh, of it, yeah. Fouling the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think with very little effort, we could probably mitigate, or not mitigate, but to ask for some uh, assistance from the USDA since they're already doing the majority of the lake to be able to get the funds to move that out along and uh, help with that issue. Ms. Best, are you, uh, when we're done this, do we want to talk about next steps and or some of, is that an appropriate place to talk about some of this or yeah, do you want I us think, to go in turn? I think the biggest thing is that uh, the board and staff are just looking for some direction and what okay. do you, do you want to do, us to Do you want to do direction on the outlet first yeah. and then taught lot or did you yeah. want to at the end? Okay. That would be easy. I just want to make sure we're not overstepping your presentation. You're fine. So at this point, let's, let's go off outlet as a topic of conversation before we get in the taught lot. Is there anything else on the outlet? Yeah, there's, there's a couple more things, if you don't mind. The uh, bathrooms were closed maybe two years ago uh, and not reopened at that time. Uh, before that, to start off, with, uh, we'll talk about uh, Clint when he was here. There was a battle going on, open it, close it, close it, open it. The battle was to test the water and then certain times of the year the bacteria is higher than other times the more you stir up the mud of course the more the uh, bacteria comes uh, to be lively because the water is not moving enough there and it's not enough air going into that water to to bubble it or change it mm -hmm. 
And then when we had uh, the next manager, uh, Howard Crow, he gave us the permission to open up the bathrooms and stuff. The water district actually went in and rebuilt uh, the fixtures and stuff so that uh, the public could use it. And we kept that open the entire summer and we didn't have one thing broken in either side, ladies or men. Now there are things that should be done. There should be painted walls and whatever to make it more beautified. But overall, they're a lot better than going to an outside party. That's for sure. We also talked about back then putting out a, a, a type of shower for when you come out of the water so you rinse off and you're not walking around with a little bit of uh, uh, whatever the bacteria on you. Uh, so I, I, I agree with the, the lady that there are many things that can be done that can make the whole area better. Rather we have the water or we don't. But I would really like to steer it towards having some type of uh, a thought system going into what would it take and how much would it take to put some air through the water and movement into that water. And I, I think there's enough smart enough people with this city to be able to do that without going out with a big uh, study. Mm. Councilor Walker? And, and I'll agree with uh, Councilor Walker and I have talked about it and I've talked about it with <coughs> Sid. Uh, the things that we can do to get this back on it's uh, such an asset to the city to have this and for us not to be able to utilize it for something that may be as simple as aeration fountains uh, treating the the, the, uh, the outlet I mean we've treated the lake if they got the, it's nothing more than that that type of problem we already have the chemicals in this for the water department we could just treat that <coughs> as well and, and make it usable but to have that sitting out there and unused is ridiculous, and we should do what it, it takes to get that going again. Yeah, I, I would, again, I, I'm going to write, I think we're all writing some of this stuff down. Some questions immediately pop up is some of the chemicals that we use to treat the water, I don't think it's safe for the environment. Uh, so that might be something that we need to bring in a outside consultant for, um, yeah, concentrations. So that, I think we need to look at some of this. And I'm not saying it doesn't need to be a hundred thousand dollar study. I'd be curious what staff has looked at for some preliminary, you know, studies based upon you know options that we may have. Um, do they do you, have you looked at anything yet? I know we talked about it a couple of years ago. I was going to say, is the water department still doing the water testing for us, or is the city well, paying to send that out? So we uh, we reached out to the water and sewer district um, midsummer when we knew we were going to put this presentation together just to get some basic tests from this year. It's towards the end of August and the beginning of September, which sometimes that's when bacterial levels mm -hmm. go back to normal because it's usually July is when it's really hot and the bacteria tends to grow. Um, so we do have a basic line to kind of go off of, and the numbers seem to be pretty consistent with what they were before. Um, which just, just, you know, they didn't count how many ducks or geese or, or any of that kind of stuff was there, but um, those numbers were included in the, in the council packet, and they seem to be pretty consistent with past years. Um, so the need for something uh, with the water quality is, it still seems pretty evident. So I, I put this on the agenda just so that one, I knew the Parks and Rec Advisory Board had been talking about this, they've been talking about it for a long time, and it's also been a project that kind of got shelved and hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, so the hope here is that if you give the, the feedback to say we need to move forward, then we would bring back out some of the reports that were done in 2013, 14, that said these are the things that you need to do to now get the lake start moving. That will be helpful for us to know if this is the direction we want to go, as we start building the budget for CIP moving forward. So that's where we're at. Okay, yeah, and I think some more. of the other things that ne will need to be done in talking with the, with the water department is they used to do regular dredging of, of that, and there's the, the, the aeration setting up. A, so one of the things, and perhaps since we're going to be engaging the, about addressing the EPA, which is a little different than what they did in the old, the Parks and Rec, I mean, the uh, Public Works would dredge it and do that work. There may be an EPA issue th and permits that we'd need to get, and perhaps when we're doing the, in, the, in this study that we're doing, to what would that take and what the cost would be associated with doing that regular dredging, 
putting in the, you know, the aeration and the other things that would have to go along with that on a yearly basis. So, but I would support the swimming. Councilor. So since we're going to be looking at the RFP soon, I just want to put it sort of out there that this could potentially be a piece of what is considered with part of the RFP. I know it is an outlet, but it is water coming from Lake Auburn. So there is effect, cause and effect there. It's just a suggestion. So hold on to that suggestion because I think this might be relevant. Let me just ask, let me try to kind of funnel this down to see if we can progress on a lot of different fronts here. There's a council and general consensus that the city of Auburn needs an outdoor swimming, um, designated swimming spot. Okay. Yes. yes. This is, we're going to funnel this down. Looking at all the different options that we have, there aren't that many um, right now, nor have we seen any other options. You mentioned Taylor Pond. There's probably some options there as well um, on a purchase standpoint, which I think we probably should explore parallel to this for a cost uh, basis comparison. Um, but any other option, does it seem that the outlet for an outdoor swimming recreation area is the most advantageous? Councilor Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. When the, previously, when the outlet was open, the city bus would go there. So people without cars <coughs> or people with only one car could take a trip up there, either with their kids or with them by themselves. They would read a book, they'd have a lunch, and sometimes vendors, and even the city had vendors there selling you know, food so people could just run and grab a sandwich, a soda, or an ice cream. So. I right now, the council is in agreement that the outlet seems to be the most advantageous spot for a natural swimming pond. Okay, I'm not talking about pools or commercial sized pools. Okay, so I think basically, if we can kind of wrap this up, and you, I'm going to paraphrase what I've heard from everyone. A, we'd like to look at what the cost is going to be. Excuse me, we'd like to look at maybe um, if it's practical an RFP adjustment amendment at the city council level to address the chemical balance needs for safe swimming within the outlet based upon historical data that we already collected. Um, that's step one. I want to make sure that fits into the mission of the RFP. Um, and we're not going to, by adding that question, get rid of the firms, you know, 90% of the firms that we're going to respond to the primary objective. So we can't make sure that that counters out each other. That's one second. Um, put that forth. And then we'd like to see maybe some scenarios, because this is not uncommon nationwide or worldwide, actually. In my brief research of this, this is, a, this is an issue. Um, I talked to the EPA in Washington about this issue in upstate New York due to climate change and, and rain patterns. Um, let's see what a potential range of costs would be for this option, maybe even the acquisition of another parcel on a different body of water, and then just literally from a catalog what the cost, run cost would be for a municipal pool to satisfy a need, though in a different vein. I think the council would probably, and again, this is where you need to interrupt me, um, look at all three options and do a cost comparison and value comparison as well in the future. Does that make sense? I think w one thing in terms of another body of water, I think we do need to consider it. Um, and I don't know how much research has been done around that. And in terms of municipal pool, the school building committee initially did a lot of research around that. So that information should be there in the initial uh, school building committee. Um, deliberations. Thank you. And I think there's some uh, there's some examples. I Portland Parks and Rec, <coughs> indoor and our outdoor, obviously the Riverton facility and the Kiwanis facility. Give you some real world examples. The uh, second piece of the uh, beach is the land itself and what we can do with it. We that needs to be uh, figured in there for a budget because basketball court, there's no volleyball court up there to play on. There should be. Uh, we proved by uh, going up to North Auburn, uh, West Auburn, that volleyball is very important, and I think we would draw more people to that area if we was to build the courts that was budgeted there 15 years ago that never got built, but the money was spent. So uh, we need to look at everything on land as well as the water problem. So Sabrina, could we look at what the, the max potential? Yep. with facilities. I think someone even mentioned tennis. Um, I'm not sure what the, what's going on with the tennis courts at the East Auburn School. Part of me says that they're in disarray and they were going to be rebuilt. I Maybe, or there's talk about they're, it. They're in disarray. They're in disarray. So if, is there... I think those ten, didn't disarray tennis may be courts an understatement. were wrapped up in a grant of some sort. 
Yes. So that's all being evaluated. We have several sites right now that are part of the land and water conservation grant funding that was received by the city back in the 70s. And that's one of those parcels that is currently uh, non-compliant that we are working with uh, the state on to uh, rectify that. So if we're going to look at it, we look at it holistically with all these different needs. Deadly Rose Point, I mean, yeah, it's uh, about time we get beach volleyball up to Auburn, you know, or Maine. It's too good of an asset for us to just leave there. It's a huge that. asset. I don't think there's anyone that doubts that. It's a huge asset. So what's how best to utilize it um, and to get people out there. So, okay, I, I think that wraps up that conversation. We have some direction, so we can probably Perfect. move on to Totlot now. Thank you. All right. So moving on to Totlot. So Totlot is out on Route 4. It's a small little park. Um, it was a fish hatchery, and in 1962, the city took it over and turned it into a park. It was a favorite field trip destination if you went to Auburn schools. It was your favorite day of the year. Um, and now it's open for events. <laughs> and now it's open for events. Um, people rent it. And it's filled almost every weekend um, with people renting it out. So it's, it's getting some use. Um, there is a working house on the property. Uh, there's a caretaker that's living there now who is nearing retirement. Um, when he is when he does retire, it will have to figure out what to do with that house. Um, from what I hear, it's not in great shape. I've not been in it, but um, it may not be something that we keep. Um, getting rid of it might just open up the space quite a bit more. Um, it also leaves the plumbing behind for the possibility of flush toilets. I am a huge flush toilet fan whenever it is feasible to have them in any public space. It's so much better than porta potties. Um, the indoor space that we do have is in good shape. It needs some cosmetic upgrades. It maybe needs some paint. It needs maybe some new refrigerators. It, it's there, but it could, it, could, it could be a little bit better with, with some love. Um, we do not have an event building there, but by adding an outdoor pavilion, we could kind of rein in the spots. So the picnic tables are all over the, the grounds. If we pulled them in, had them under the cover, they would also last longer. Some of them are in a little bit of beat up shape because they're outside all winter long. We have long winters. There are barbecue pits there that are in terrible shape. Um, so if we pulled everything together, had the barbecue pits and all of it in an outdoor pavilion, it would also be a great place for the events to take place that we're having there. Uh, there is a playground at this park, and if you went as a kid, it is exactly the same. It has not changed, even a little bit. Um, so we're asking, do we even need a playground at this park? If this is an event-centered park, does it mix with this mission? Um, it's got maybe four sets of swings. Um, so maybe keeping one set of swings and one of the little climbing, climbing structures and then, you know, four events, but do you need more than that? And again, if we got rid of the playground, you would have, oh, you're fine. Sorry about that. <laughs> Gosh, I talk with my hands. Um, if you got rid of the playground, again, you would have more space for that outdoor pavilion and just to have events. Um, the grounds and trails. It's a nice park, but the grounds need a little bit of love. Um, it's a little bit overgrown. There's a really beautiful stream that runs all the way down this property. With some nice maintenance, it could really be beautiful. It has that water feature that's there. Could we put a fountain in the water feature? Um, there's a fountain that's been there for ages, and it just kind of sits. It's not used. Um, and, and could we move that fountain somewhere else in the city and use it? Does it have to be in tot lot where nobody's going to see it? Could we pull it and put it in a median that's over in Auburn. I mean, could we put it somewhere where we're going to use these things? Because if it sits there for another 20 years, it's not going to be any good. It would be nice to use the things that we have. And that's all I have, you guys. That's all I have for Tatla. And before I open this up to questions, that fountain is historic Art Deco fountain. I think Leroy's moved that thing three times on his own over the course Use of the years it. but this thing is i mean that's they don't make them like that no, anymore. It's, so a right. it's a beautiful fountain beautiful fountain we could find a spot for it somewhere in the city where Fleming we see Hall. it we could swim we could swim in it uh, <laughs> oh not in the fountain you want to swim in the i'm like we could swim, swim in the fountain, in the fountain <laughs> put the fountain at the uh outlet true so, so there's all this let's ask some questions first then we'll kind of run through the same process we did before Councilor Zanya. when's the last time you did a survey of all the parks in the city like how many parks, how many parks are there in Auburn? How many parks? Mm -hmm. 20 something, roughly, give or take. Sometime 
n not now, obviously, it would be nice to just get a survey, give us a little tour of the parks that currently exist. So it would be nice to think of them as a whole system as opposed to just individual things. So if you go on our website, um, there. there's a hub there that Rosemary created, and you can I'll click all the parks that we have. Okay, They're all great. listed. Councilor Kerry? I had a quick couple of questions. One, uh, you talk about a trail system out there. Do we yes. know how long the trail system is? So the trail system is pretty overgrown. Um, and the tot lot side, you can't really find the trails. But if you come in through the Townsend Brook side, I think you'll have a lot more luck getting to them. So getting them reestablished. Um, but there could be a great trail system out there. We could use it in the summer and spring for hiking. But in the winter, it could make a great cross-country ski trails or snowshoeing. That could be a great year-round park with the right trail system. Uh, and I guess my second question is, if we're looking for an outdoor uh, space uh, pavilion type thing, uh, what, I guess, the size of, that we would utilize out there that would make it worthwhile? Well, the fact that it's rented every weekend now, if we had a bigger pavilion, you'd be able to rent it for a little bit more money if we had more of an offering. And then it could you be used for small weddings, anniversary parties. I mean, I feel like it's a... I don't know, it's a good one for Yeah, for over that. this summer, it was rented out 12 oh, times. Sorry. The way it's rented, it's $100 for the whole day. Um, and again, most of those rentals are birthday parties or um, baby showers and, and that kind of sense. We've had a few small weddings and, and family gatherings and stuff, but if you were to provide a space that is more of an event style, you could do class reunions or weddings or you know, mm -hmm. those style of events um, and working with you know, a third party vendor to put up the tables, the nice chairs and, and so on and so forth. Because I immediately thought of Fort Foster down in Southern Maine they have an outdoor pavilion that's it is very nice and they're no. constantly busy down there. nice good so oh. but there are no outdoor bathroom accessible bathrooms at this point correct we Not put a porta potty there question the botanical gardens of booth bay mm -hmm. i know obviously, i mean huge draw i mean we've had parks and rec programming out there before and it's well it's beautiful and i'm not saying suggesting that we turn us you know, taught a lot into a botanical garden, though, while well, we're on that but note, is that municipal? But, we could. but as an example, is that a municipal um, property? And I, you don't have to, I don't expect you to have the answers now. Is it municipal? Is it private? Who runs that? How does that work? Nonprofit, I'd imagine. Um, because the English garden, and if we're looking at tying sports tourism up with recreation, um, and if you have an asset that is topographically wise there, would it make sense? So that just throw that out there as a follow-up. Do the trails, do we know if those trails connect with the ones around Lake Auburn? Is it close enough that these trails Ooh. could connect? You know, I'm not sure if I they do. I would not know. No, nope. I, I know they, tra they, they connect to the ones over on Townsend Brook Road. Right. All behind. I'm not sure if they go in the other direction. But that's a great question. But could they go in the other direction? That's, that's yeah, right. you know, if, offer a pretty good trail system. Councilor? Yeah, I'll talk about a couple of the things that you had brought up. The house, number one, if we take the house down, you will, will never be able to use the bathrooms. It's a small septic system, and it has caused us problems in the past, which goes back 30 years or more. So it's just about big enough to take care of one or two people that may live in the house. 30 years ago, we also had a plan that had a septic system pumping station, and new bathrooms on the clubhouse. Now, the new bathrooms could be moved in a different place if you decided to, to demolish the clubhouse. Uh, and the clubhouse is old. It only has a 100-amp system for, uh, from CMP. That would have to be upgraded if you kept the old clubhouse. Uh, see old-style windows, which are very dangerous. That should be changed as well. A lot of work was done to that building many, many years ago, but it has been many years. The grounds, in my opinion, we should go across the brook to build something that would be like you said, mm -hmm. and keep the front side for more of a little recreation area. I believe you can probably look at a heck of a lot of young kid birthday parties and stuff in that area, and I think that's why it's important to keep some recreation <clears throat> in the front uh, swing sets if you watch them in the summer they probably get used more than anything else up there so 
Uh, and I know they're old, they've been there, I put them up uh, almost 50 years ago, so I, I know they've got a lot of age and wear and tear. But I wouldn't eliminate too many of them if it was me. One set is not enough if you're bringing a, a crowd of 30, 40 people into that area. The fountain, until we decide there's a nice place in town, I would ask the manager to please find a way of putting it in the budget to plug it back in and put a small pump there that won't cost the city $100 in power and it won't cost you no more than $100 to put a small pump there. I ran that thing for years and years and don't let one of your employees tell you that it can't be done. We ran it for 10 years after I moved it there from the water district until somebody else took over the authority of unplug that thing, we don't like it there. So uh, it could come back to full use and it is beautiful. We've had weddings. The people have, years ago, I used to make a point to go up and plug it in, get it running for them. They got married there. We unplugged it so nobody else would get into any kind of trouble. But barbecue pits and all that could be updated, be much better for the people going. The, the little brook should be cleaned. There should be some new walls put in there, and we should bring back raising some fish there so it attracts people that love to come up and watch small trout and other things in, in there, especially when you're talking hatchery, small fish that got color. You could do that easy. That's spring water. It's so cold that very few people will even go in there with their toes because it's so cold. But that could be done very easily and bring that back to life. So, Councilor, did you have something, Councilor Mills? Yeah, well, I was going to say, it sounds to me like it's a an asset that we should, based on the way that the strategic plan, recreation, outdoor activities, that this fits. Let me, um, okay, very good. Let me uh, give you some, just some uh, two numbers here. As we've been talking, I wanted to kind of look at GIS mapping and to see about the trails. I can't see the trails on this map because they're not mapped. Um, it's, this total park is 15 acres of land, broken up into two parcels. Uh, it's a rectangular in shape. It is surrounded by, on three sides, by 158 acres of undeveloped land currently owned by the Auburn Water Department uh, or district. Um, on one side, it's bordered by a neighborhood and access road, okay, an existing neighborhood off Route 4 and Center Street. If, and I'm gonna ask some questions again, kind of funnel this down. Knowing what we know about our entire inventory, um, or actually, no, we don't know we kind of have an idea of our inventory of parks. It is on the website, so we can look at it, almost con uh, conclusive. Um, is this something that makes sense for the city of Auburn to pursue resources that are finite on? Is this something that the council wants to pursue a plan of modernization and bringing back? Yes. I'll ask you this question first to Misty. Misty, if you had your choice of two, I uh, one of two items, with a finite amount of uh, capital, we had to choose between the outlet and tot lot, which one would you recommend us to choose? I think that to start the beach is the priority. To start with each? No, to start the beach. Oh, the beach. Sorry, the Very beach. Good. Okay. We do have the to come up with a name. Okay. There was a hotel there called Lake Grove. So yes. yeah, everybody calls it colloquialism, the outlet. Um, so the beach. Now, I'm going to ask the counselor. We don't have to, you know, obviously come up with a decision on this. It's not paramount. But the thought process is looking at the overall priority level of what we have. Um, we might have to make that decision later on in budget season. But are we in agreement now that we want to look forward to a plan which is, uh, incorporates a return on investment plan, money to be made, money to be invested? What would you invest that? What would the budget be in this budget season that's coming right up? And give staff that direction. Can I make a couple comments? Uh, keep in mind the beach, the whole beach area works fine the way it is. So. What we're looking at, I think, is, is like we said, a budget for putting in new stuff and a budget that's gonna put us a beach back in place. So uh, depending on which way we really wanna push this and where do we have money is the way we gotta go. Tot lot is in perfect shape the way it is right now until we wanna make improvements. Now where are we gonna start? It's $100,000 to start with a brand new system up there so you can go to the bathroom, and we had that years ago. We know what it takes. We know that uh, that's an, uh, well, what do you call it, Lake Auburn watershed place. It takes something great 
in order to get it to pass by them so the water doesn't get polluted from the new system. So you've got that to look at, and then if, uh, would we take the building down or wouldn't we? Would we take mm -hmm. the second one down, mm -hmm. wouldn't we? So th there has to be a lot of broken down parts to that as well. But I, I don't want us to sit here and think, well, because we're gonna put, we'll say 300,000 in the beach, we're gonna let the tot lot go because that's not what I want to look at. Can, let me, uh, we we need Milk. to keep them both operating and fix yeah. them. Councilor Milks? It seems like the, the beach, would be an ongoing yearly operational budget, much more than a capital budget, whereas tot lot, we're gonna have a smaller operational budget, but we're looking at a fairly large capital investment should we want it. So to me, we might be at two different budgets. If a council, if I could, let me make a suggestion to see if you think this is good. Because one thing that we're circling around with the tot lot that we addressed already with the beach, what, what does the final product look like, okay? We've talked about vision, we've talked about and gave uh, direction out to Sabrina and Misty. What could be included in there, St. Volleyball, obviously swimming, we have plan A, B, and C. One thing we're missing on the tot lot though is, what is that final vision? Is it just to enhance it, add bathrooms, or is it to make it into, let's go extreme, an English tea party, a tea party garden with a botanical garden? I mean, what is that vision that we want to see there? Council but, uh, I'll answer for, you know, um, Mr. Dubois that came in last, last meeting and talked about the image of our city and if we were to beautify something like the tot lot that whole area and create a, a, a place that people maybe even from outside the city want to come to have a wedding and have a beautiful place to me that adds value to our community so I'll answer for mr. I think okay I think that makes sense council do you are we in agreement of something that if you want to have if you're gonna do it do it larger do it with a sense of attraction do have the sense of ROI? Yes. Councilor Zahn, you had something to add? Just a quick thing I want to make sure that there's access. I think Councilor Gary mentioned the bus going out there. And the other thing is I still want to see it as a system of parks. I know that they're very different, but I think we need to look all around. And if we're putting money into something at, and not putting it into other parks, I, just, I want to think of it as a park system that we have in this community. Fair enough. Um, are we in Councillor McLeod? Yeah, I just wanted to agree with Councillor Walker. I think this is more of a, if we look to see what the largest, biggest, expansive thing is we can make and start paring it down, because it could be over three or four budget cycles, as long as we have that goal in mind of what we want it to look like, we can start picking pieces off of it and, and get it up there while maintaining what we have now without losing anything. So I'd like to turn this, I, I think the consensus here is make it substantial, make it something that Aubrey can be proud of, uh, make it something that's unique in the region um, and then create that plan. I think a lot of the, this gets pushed back to your committee, Misty, Okay. to make that concept, that plan, find case studies, find examples, um, and then with staff's assistance, find some potential costs and maybe phased out approach, depending if it's needed or not, what the final outcome is, and then present back to us before obviously the budget cycle. Fair enough? Agreement? Yeah. Okay. Councilor Walker? Uh, I got one more comment. Uh, as you're entering into the tot lot, for most people may not know, as you're going in, you're, you're following, because the road you're riding on to get in, cross over a brook, uh, and that brook comes from further up in the turnaway. And then uh, as you look to your left, there's another road that comes in. That road goes into a huge sand pit that is not owned by Lake Auburn or anybody. and you know, maybe 50 years from now, we could purchase some more land that goes that way because we are right, if you look at your map, we're right on the line of that gravel pit. And it might be a day that we could buy a section of that, which could expand that quite a lot to do more, you know, more recreation. Right now it's things. protection land owned by AWD, which can be actually utilized and should be yeah. for recreation as an imperative. So I think there's a lot of things to look at and a lot of we're here for you to help mm -hmm. you in this process, including staff. Um, but I want to, on behalf of the council, I want to thank you very much for your time on this. So now so this is a uh, good direction for the city. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, at this time, I'd like to move on to the third workshop. We do have four workshops, and what we'll do is we're going to do the third. I think we'll get it done before seven. Um, the third workshop, I'll call the meeting order, and then we will go right into the fourth workshop before we get into our business agenda for the night. Um, the next is an update on boards, committees, uh, boards and committees.
Um, we're going to have uh, Councillor Boss, myself, Matt Duval from the Planning Board come in for this, and Brian Wood is Assistant City Manager. He is joining us, I believe. Oh, hey, Brian. How you doing? It's remotely. Uh, so um, I think we'll be able to get him all queued up with the magic of technology. So give us a second to get set up. Um, in the meantime, taking the gavel. Mayor Pro Tem. Matt, you can go ahead and join us. Will do. Thank Okay, very good. Good evening. Well, I can take this off from here. Good evening. Um, I'm Jason Levesque, the mayor. Right now, we're going to be presenting. What I'd like to do is just to give you uh, in the fr uh, way of introductions. We, uh, the city council, actually passed this order earlier this year, forming the mayor's ad hoc and supporting it on boards, commissions, and um, appointments. So we've been meeting relatively. I'd like to call out some of our members, Councilor Gary, Councilor Boss, the Planning Board Chairman, Matt Duval, and Assistant City Manager, Brian Wood, and the City Manager, Phil Kroll, as well as Sue Clements Delaire, our City Clerk, and Liz Allen, who is our communications director. So we met pretty frequently, actually every Thursday, um, nonstop when we could, late summer, early fall, uh, in order to kind of hash out what our mission was. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna explain the mission statement a little bit, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Councilor Boss, who's gonna talk about actions taken, and then we're gonna turn it over to uh, Assistant City Manager Wood, and then Matt Duval, and then I'll end up wrapping up too, along with help from the rest of uh, the, the committee, okay? So first of all, the mission. Let's hit the space bar. Oh, I'm an Apple guy. Here we go. First, to develop a modernization of Auburn's many boards, commissions, and committees to facilitate a more cohesive workflow, generating greater impact and efficient use of staff and volunteer time and effort. All committees and boards should endeavor to increase communication between committee and council, increase opportunity for public participation, and with, and with council direction, envision and present new innovative ways to move the city forward. In a nutshell, we want to make sure that our boards and commissions and committees are more inclusive, more thoughtful, and actually focusing on the goals that the council directs through tactical or strategic planning. So with that, um, that's our mission, and we try to make sure that everything that we did balanced and did not conflict with that mission. I'd like to turn over to Councillor Boss to uh, go the next step, you want to do it there? Okay. Yeah, I can do it right from here if you want to hit the space bar. Oh, there you go. Thank you. So I'm going to review the actions that we, take, that we took and the mission that we fulfilled. Um, the first bullet point that you'll see talks about streamlined communication procedures. That was directly part of the mission of this group to ensure that all of the committees have better communication flow with one another and more collaborative process. So that was the first bullet point. We've worked on that as part of our proposal. We also created some standard operating procedures, just all of the different processes that um, should be consistent between all committees, because we did find that there were some inconsistencies that made it a little bit more difficult across the board. We also established some committee reporting frequency based on a revised communication plan. And we can talk a little bit more about that in detail later, but we have, what we're proposing is that each committee has an annual work plan and that they report back to the council on a regular basis to check in on that work plan so that the council can be best supportive of the committees and then ensuring that there's good communication between all the different committees and boards and commissions. We have also reduced the number of committees that you'll see in the presentation later on. We've also adjusted the open enrollment period to twice a year with three-year terms for all boards, committees, and commissions that we have the authority to do so, uh, make that change too. That will help in a lot of ways administratively from Sue's perspective. Um, we also think that that will help to drive interest um, in applying by the community by being able to really market those two open enrollment periods with the community. I think it'll gender a little bit more excitement and interest in participation. Um, the last bullet point on this slide is that uh, mayoral appointments would be effective for a two-year term. Next slide, please. 
so and at the top, you'll see there are committees required to submit minutes and participate in an onboarding orientation process. This was a specifically a place where we thought there could be strengthened to ensure that all committees are receiving the same information. They're given that same strong foundation to start upon um, and everyone is on the same page. And I think that's really critical for um, success within each committee, but also across the city with all the committees, boards and commissions. Um, an orientation process that, that is um, consistent is also really critical. So we're all following those same processes and staff is on board, committee members are on board and the council is also clear on what our processes are. Second bullet point down there, you'll see an introduction of minimal compensation for planning board members to reinforce and compensate for significant workload. This is a very similar proposal to what you see on the school board. Um, so a, um, a fee for each meeting for each of the committee members is what we're proposing. And then the last bullet point there, no board or committee can create committees or subcommittees. All existing non-mandated subcommittees will be absorbed and working groups will be encouraged for short, short duration projects. And I believe Mr. Mayor that you wanted to expand upon that last bullet point, that's correct? Uh, yes, just so when we're talking about work groups versus subcommittees, uh, subcommittees are permanent standing that normally takes staff involvement. Uh, and that is becoming an issue, especially when you can create your own subcommittees. But the point is, how do you get, uh, the, with the goal, our mission rather, how do you get more people involved for short duration projects? Working groups seems to be the most practical way to do that. I'll give a great example. Um, Age Friendly Committee has uh, their bean hole bean suppers, Thanksgiving. There's a lot of individuals that would love to be part of a very focused scope of work that has a few month in duration and then step back. This way it allows rotations to happen, more people to be involved in order to accomplish a very finite goal. Um, so we would encourage, they probably do it already, I know they do it, but a working group of concerned people to come together to accomplish that one goal. So that's really the difference between a work group and a subcommittee. It's the nature, the tenure, and you know what they're doing for a short duration, okay? Do we have any right. questions at this point? It might be helpful, yeah. And I think I just heard Brian also. Oh, all right. Um, can, if everyone can hear me, I feel like I've come full circle here. Um, Brian, did we want to do questions first on oh, just a section with Councillor Boss? Was there any? Yeah. I didn't see. I think that sounds good. Sorry, Brian. Um, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> I've really appreciated how equity has come to the forefront in terms of making sure that we're addressing that. And I just wonder if that comes into this in any way, whether it's this will be part of what we do is to create equity and access to these boards for a diverse number of people. I'm not telling you what to say, but I just don't know if this is a place or if there is a place for a statement about that here. Yeah, I think there's certainly an opportunity to do that as part of the review of the processes and the orientation and onboarding and looking at how we do outreach for those two open enrollment periods. I think it's really critical, but would take a, a deeper dive. I'm not the mayor, I'm just having a gavel council was on. Who's in charge here? You've got to bang something, I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm not so sure that I agree with you when you say that, that no boards or committees can create uh, other committees or subcommittees to work with them, especially with the age friendly. The age friendly is such a big, uh, it, it's got so many different uh, factors and limbs to it that a chair himself, herself, cannot. Uh, run that whole board by itself with a committee of only four or five. So, like we'll, we'll say, Melinda, for instance, is involved in uh, the uh, buses that roam around the city in Auburn. I, I don't feel that I'm up to speed on all that. So I would say to Melinda, please take this on and get a couple more people to work with you to see if we can't look at this further do something and something and something so i you're going to tie the hands of people yep. that need to reach out with three or four different arms in order to pull something together no actually that's exactly what that was you did to find it perfect you defined it better than i did but that is exact definition of a work group it's you know council gary we got to wrap our arms around this can you go take three or four people from the community solve the problem report back to us when you're done that, that's basically what a work group is. But, it, but it's, it's, a, it's a committee of people that do that, and they would answer back, 
to the chairperson. They wouldn't answer to you or to Phil. They may ask him questions. Correct. They may want your input. Correct. But I, I don't think I would tie people's hands by saying that. Moment. It's not. It's actually everything you just described. It's not a report back to the chair of the committee. So it's exactly how you defined it. So, and we do have a, a process at the end of this, which we'll touch upon about deconfliction to answer some of those questions and make sure that any of these potential conflicts that might arise are deconflicted. But that would, your explanation of it, Councilor Walker, is exactly what the intent was. So. Can we go back to the two and three year thing on there? Yeah. The, uh, when, when you say the, the two and year, are you talking just committees at this point? You're not talking councilors being elected or whatever at this point, right? Just committees. The, I think one of the things there, if it's a councilor, we may get into a little bit of a problem, unless you're going to say, if we choose not to run, uh, we'll, we'll just say that I was appointed right now for three years, and I choose not to run next November, who's going to take the next two years? Am I out or am I still in to be that three-year term person? You're still, you're still in. That you, you came in as a uh, member of the advisory board, not as a councilor. So as long as it's not a council appointment committee, then you, you would still be uh, on there completing your term. Uh, and this wouldn't include any vacancies. So if vacancies come up, then that process still, still happens. It's just the enrollment times because we have multiple boards and committees that have three to five year terms and they stagger. And so this would just make it consistent. Yeah, because when we built a committee, uh, I'm sure we did that. We put staggered times in it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to be sure where we were with it. Yeah. Brian? I think we're good. Brian? Uh, good evening, everyone. I uh, hope you can all hear me. Uh, so the next um, slide is uh, the first of three um, advisory boards uh, that the group kind of came up with. Uh, this is one that is particularly interesting and really achieves uh, the primary goal of streamlining um, and reducing uh, the number of committees. Uh, and so what we were able to do, um, looking at a very unique through line, was um, collapse the Board of Assessment, the Ethics Panel, Board of Appeals, and Audit Council um, by creating a seven-member board uh, that is comprised of uh, two mayoral appointments, two school board appointments, um, and three individuals that are appointed through uh, the appointment committee um, and confirmed um, by the council. And so what this uh, really created was um, a board that focused on and had the technical expertise, uh, a judgment through line, um, and faced both the business and community uh, in a unique way to address all of these areas. And so this uh, regulatory advisory board would uh, meet monthly and would be um, acting in different capacities based on the issues that were presented uh, before them. And one of the things that uh, really jumped out at the committee was there were a number of um, boards that were meeting, especially uh, with these that have been outlined here, um, that were meeting very sporadically. Um, some would meet you know, every month for a two or three month period and then perhaps not meet for a year or longer. Um, and so what we were trying to do was to both streamline the number of individuals that were uh, involved. That way we would be able to get a uh, more active and robust uh, advisory board together, um, but also to make sure that we were able to address the issues that were being presented uh, before these various boards um, as efficiently as possible. Uh, a prime example is uh, there was uh, a request um, by the city for uh, on a matter that required uh, the convening of the ethics panel. Um, and that took uh, several months uh, for that to be, uh, for the panel to be assembled uh, due to vacancies, uh, which uh, the city manager just spoke briefly about, um, and then to convene. And so 
this really is an opportunity to provide um, more effective and efficient uh, resolutions to the business and community, uh, but to also make sure that those that are part of these um, boards um, are now going to be meeting uh, with a greater level of frequency um, and increase the level of training and engagement um, that these seven members uh, will be um, receiving in an ongoing basis, as well as consistent interaction and engagement um, with the staff that are assigned to be supporting this committee or with this board. Yeah, well, before we have questions, a little, there's still some conflictions that might need to be arranged with the audit council or the audit committee. Right now we have two city council appointments I make and you all certify or verify. Same thing with the school board. Uh, we need to really have a discussion on whether or not we want city councilors on this regulatory advisory board. I think it'd be great unless there's an issue of ethics that come up. I think it'd be good to recuse yourself regardless if you're involved or not. That's why we have an independent ethics board and that's why we maintain the mayoral appointment which isn't councilors. Those are two individuals that the mayor historically has appointed, non-elected. So there's a little bit of deconfliction we have to look at with audit and mayoral council appointments to this. Um, we probably need to talk about um, over the next month or so. So I just want to put that out there. From a framework, it's like 90% done, but there is some tweaking that needs to happen. So you got the gavel. Um, why are some of these in orange? What does that denote? Those oh, are yes. Uh, so the orange are, um, and you'll see that in uh, a number of other slides as well. Um, and those uh, denote the fact that they are um, required by either state or federal law. Um, and so that there is a level uh, of um, governing or oversight that we have to meet um, to fulfill those requirements as well. And so that's just denoting those two things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't explain that before. <laughs> Matt, Matt, you want to continue now? Yep. Okay. I think we'll move right along to the next. I got a question for you. You have the, you still have the appointment committee in year three. Uh, it, it, for the last, what is it, year, two years, it's been, seems to me it's been a problem. Are you sure that that's the way you want to keep that committee? I'm sorry, for, say it again? What committee? Appointment what? committee. You've got three. That's what it looks like to me. Anyways. No, no, no. That's, that's not the appointment. That's three um, members coming out of appointment committee. They put their app, just like now, they put their application in. Appointment committee f pushed for us to the council, three recommendations, and then the council votes on it. Those aren't members of the appointment committee or the appointment committee. Those are just people that go through the appointment committee process, just like they do now for ethics and board of appeal, not ethics, but board of appeals, board of assessment. Okay, so that's, that's just coming out of. We'll make that clear on the next version. Yep. Yeah. Is, is, is it, I guess the question is, is the appointment committee going to be still the way it is, or is it? Stay set? exact the same way it is. Except you'll be meeting less often because we'll have two open enrollment periods instead of random appointments monthly. So it'll be more structured to it. Ideally, you'd only have to meet twice a year to cover all the appointments in that year. <laughs> you think that's uh, you think that's going to work, Brian? At the pace we've been going this year and last year, uh, we had a lot of complaints that trying to meet it takes two months to actually get together for a meeting. They're still going, and uh, we had a lot of complaints that people had to wait and wait and wait because of that. Ideally, so. yes, this is going to fix that because it's a proper SOP that, if adopted and followed, um, and with enough runway and timeline, yes, it will make it better. Uh, and I would also uh, say that I think this also gets at that, uh, Councillor, because there are um, fewer individuals, um, again, moving from 21 down to 7, uh, with more consistency or frequency in meeting. Uh, so there's a little bit more predictability in that as well. So once it is uh, staffed and moving forward, um, hopefully the engagement uh, process will, will ensure um, fewer vacancies as well. Okay, I disagree, but that's okay. <laughs> we have to be optimistic. Optimistic. Well, I mean, we—I've been around a long time here, and you can't 
you can't stop boards, especially planning board. When people move away and people get sick and people die, you can't tell me that six months down the road, you know, no, no, that's no, going to work. It don't, it don't months, three mem months. Remember what I said, we've said earlier, this is an SOP, but it also has an exemption policy. And the city manager said it as well, if there is a vacancy, we reconvene and we fill that vacancy. Okay. That's going to happen. But just the, I, the, the, the chances of it happening by decreasing some of the, uh, the members on this board greatly diminish. Okay. So you're actually making the pool a bit tighter and smaller. So, but we can, but that is definitely a point that needs to go through, I think, in good faith. Um, and it works in other organizations. So, so we'll turn it over. Oh, I just had one quick question. So you're going to be having two people that are appointed by the school committee to act on the board of assessments, ethics panels, and board of appeals. At a minimum, they're supposed to be on the audit council or audit committee. Mm -hmm. um, one of those is also a currently chartered appointment to ethics. Okay with an alternate. So it's actually a couple more. There's still a little bit of organization that has to be done there. I'm not sure, and I don't know if this body is sure about having school board members um, weigh in on Board of Appeals or Board of Assessment material. So, but the concept here is tighter, more effective work groups and people, and that's why audits over as a subcommittee. Good. Fair <clears throat> enough, okay. And I'll turn it over to Matt DeVal. Okay, thank you. Um, so our next, the next advisory board that we came up with, unlike that the regulatory is not a, um, a contraction of multiple, multiple committees into one, but rather was formed to increase communication uh, between boards and committees and also to facilitate things for staff. Um, the second goal in this was actually to increase public participation, to create a place where someone like Chamber of Commerce could, Commerce could come in and um, talk with multiple groups and increase coordination across the city. So what this board does, the Growth and Development Advisory Board, is it brings together the Planning Board, the Agricultural Committee, the Conservation Commission, CDBG, Complete Streets, and the Citizens Advisory Board. Those last three, CDBG, Complete Streets, and Citizens Advisory are, as was mentioned earlier, mandated externally. Um, <clears throat> the membership of this board would be seven people, and if you look up there, you see there are six boards or committees underneath that, and it would be the chair of five of them plus two city council appointments. But you'll note that Citizens Advisory Committee already has a city, uh, city council appointment in it. So we would only need five instead of six additional people. So that comes up with a board of seven. Um, <clears throat> meetings will be quarterly and as needed. Um, in order to make this happen, there will be a couple changes that are proposed. Actually, the first to the planning board. Um, one member of the planning board, the, this, this group thought, should actually be appointed to complete streets to increase communication there. Um, and the second is to the Conservation Committee, Conservation or Conservation Commission. Conservation Commission right now has two subcommittees. It's got one on forestry and it has one on parks. So forestry is actually a central function to the Ag Committee. And so the thought of this board was actually to move any discussion of actual forestry from the Conservation Commission to the Ag Committee. Note that this would not preclude the Conservation Commission from talking about forest conservation, right? This is just forestry. The second uh, parks is gonna get pulled out and put into what you'll hear about and from Mayor Levesque in a little bit, a Parks and Recreation Committee. So that about sums it up. As planning board member, I think it's really gonna actually help us communicate better with things like Conservation Commission, Ag Committee, and Complete Streets. So I think it's great. I really appreciate the reorganization and how you're integrating these. Small question, um, why is it a Conservation Commission as opposed to committee? Is there a reason that, that we use that nomenclature? Yeah, it's a state statute. Okay, thank you. Anything else before we move on? This is, I mean, this really ties in as well with our strategic planning, uh, talking about growth, talking about development, and trying to get together 
like um, like groups. One thing is too, this communication flows to the board, but it also flows from the council to the board, yeah. to the committees, and then vice versa. So, but council. Uh, just a quick question, because you mentioned that to the growth and stuff. Uh, I'm wondering if it wouldn't be a better location for a school committee, for somebody from the school committee to be on this, more particularly the planning board, because a lot of what the planning board will do will affect the school committee, especially when you're talking about development, residential development, apartments and stuff, because I think now the superintendent meets or has meetings with the planning committee when there are new developments to see how that affects the school. So it's just a thought. Uh, I'm wondering, actually, if they have historically. I don't think so, they have. Are they at, now? Uh, but they should. They should, though. There, yeah. there hasn't. So let's see. Since March, I haven't had any such meeting. But Kate, Katie, in the past, has, has, has talked about, you know, when we did the Minot Avenue apartments and, again, when they did the, the first. North River Road. North River. Well, I call them the cemetery apartments. But uh, she said that she had talked with the, the planning board, so I didn't know if it was Evan or anybody in particular, but she was made aware of those of the subdivisions that were going in, and she was able, because a lot of, you know, it will require the school committee to shuffle. I mean, if you have a large subdivision go in, say, you know, I'd exit 75 and you were going to build uh, mm -hmm. 50 apartments, uh, family apartments, well, that would require the, the school committee to possibly have to shuffle students around to move it so that the schools can accommodate. So that's what I was thinking. Yeah, no, and, okay. and, that's, and we have a school board representative on the comp plan review for that purpose. Um, I think we should put this as a follow-up and maybe a dotted line from staff to staff in order to kind of convey information back and forth versus policy-making members. But I think it's something that we could look at our deconfliction meetings later on with the chairs. It's a great point, though. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. The, the dotted staff to staff actually sounds like a pretty good way forward in that. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I meet with the superintendent every other week. Uh, we actually talked about development and growth uh, at our last meeting about where future growth is happening, so she's aware of it. But I, I like the the uh, staff to staff, and we can put the school department under staff assignments um, on there. And I think it would be a good use. <clears throat> just one more thing I'd like to add for this slide is that the relationship between the board and the associated committees and commissions uh, is one of communication. The board is not there to direct or to regulate what the uh, committees beneath it um, do. The point is to have that kind of collaboration and conversation on a quarterly basis so that you can connect and make sure that all of the efforts of the distinct boards are synergistic. One more. The uh, ag and the uh, conservation, are you going to, if you put them together, are you going to grow that committee that much? They're not together. They're separate. The boards still meet. They still work and do their work. They have separate meetings. It's, it's only quarterly or as needed that the chairs of each of these committees, plus the two city councilors, come forward and meet and talk about what's going on, what type of support they need, what, they, what the council needs to support. That's that. Uh, it's just an advisory. It won't, probably won't be staffed at all. It won't be open. It doesn't need to be. It's just more of a, a facilitation meeting and make sure everything's working smooth, a checkup, if you would. So yeah. they're not going to be working. <coughs> Ag and conservation will not be joined. Second question. Complete streets, do they meet every month? They meet yes. regularly, yeah. When they meet, do they meet here or do they meet somewhere else? They alternate back and forth, I think, between Lewiston and Auburn. So you're saying you'd like to see a councilman on that, that uh, a planning, board planning, board planning board member. Planning board member. So that he would go back and forth both if they if they travel to Lewiston for their meeting, he he would go to I think so. I mean if you're on complete streets, you're on complete streets. That's sort of how, how I feel it. I actually served that same purpose when I was on the planning board. I was also concurrently on the complete streets committee, not as a city appointee, but as a public health community member. Um, and it was really valuable to have that overlap. <clears throat> Well, I personally look at it the other way, 
that the, the street person should come and report to the planning board, not the planning board person, follow them around. I, I just think they've got enough work on their, their backs already without being on that committee. I'll make a note of that. <coughs> Seven o'clock. Um, okay, let's take a one minute break and I'll call the meeting in order and then we're going to take care of this workshop, which I'll do because we have visitors and guests from away. Um, and this workshop item is almost about 10 minutes from being done. We'll finish this portion up, go into our communications, and then do our fourth workshop. Okay? Okay, very good. Stand by. <laughs> I'll now, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll now call to order this meeting of October 19th, 2020. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, thank you. For those of you that are joining in for our regular council meeting, uh, we are doing workshops. We're going to continue our third workshop and wrap that up in the next few minutes. Then we're going to move on to some regular business, uh, excuse me, city council business, and then back to our fourth and final workshop of the evening. We do presentations. That's what we'll do. Yeah, we're going to do. So we have some presentations and visitors from away that we'd like to address. To be courteous, some of them had a very long drive. And then after that is done, then we're going to come back to our workshop. Okay. So let me get back over here. Okay, um, so that was Growth and Development Advisory Board. We're going to move on to the third hierarchy, if you would, which is our Community Advisory Board. I'm going to explain this a little bit. So what we wanted to do is, based upon a strategic plan, we wanted to bring in an increased communication or the facilitative facilitation of communication between non-governmental organizations, nonprofits, community members, everybody from the Auburn Business Association to Community Little Theater, the Friends of Mount Appetite, and a whole host of other um, specialized groups, as well as really look at our quality of life and the committees that we currently had and how they affected quality um, and how we could best support them. So on our community advisory board, what we have is three standing committees that are city council committees. Parks and Recreation Committee. If you notice a big change here, it, it moves from a recreation um, advisory board to parks being taken, not taken, but moved from conservation into recreation and then elevated to a full committee status. Second, Auburn, Auburn Public Library. Auburn, Auburn Public Library. Um, obviously, they have their own trustees, their own governance, um, but they do have a council appointee uh, through the mayor to their board of directors, currently it's Councilor Boss, that, and they're funded about 90% of from the city budget. So what we wanted to do is such, such an integral cog is have them under this hierarchy as well, primarily for a communications piece. And third is the Age Friendly Committee. Obviously, Age Friendly is a huge additive to our community and our quality of life for all age groups. So these three committees would form, or the chairs of each one of these would form the board composition along with two additional city councilors. At that point, that board will meet to help with, just like we said with before, with the other boards, but facilitation of communications back and forth, directives, information, whatever the case is, they're there to support. But this board also acts as a sounding board or a communication pathway for all of our other non uh, NGOs and other nonprofit organizations within the city. For example, if the Friends of um, the Corner Park off Davis Avenue came and said, yeah, we really like some help beautifying our Corner Park, they would start here and talk to this board, talk to the counselors, talk to the other chairs of the board in order to see what the feasibility of it was, help them down the path of our CDBG grants, facilitate communication, or maybe put something in the budget um, and propose that out with the city manager to the council next budget season. So this is really kind of a clearinghouse and a repository for information, um, all about quality of life. 
Uh, I actually love this board because it's ambiguous in nature and it really s solves that strategic uh, mission that we, I was, there's a conundrum that we always talked about with communication to all these other disparative groups throughout the city. Brings it all together, gives them kind of a central place to meet. Um, and again, by invite and or just by their own request. But the voting members, because there might be votes that need to happen here with regards to recommendations for funding, will be the two city councilors and the three chairs. That is the final permanent makeup of that committee. Um, before we go into board conf configuration benefits, are there any questions regarding the community advisory board? Just a quick question. I know Councillor Boss is on the Auburn Public Library. Would, so that would be two more city councillors in addition to, or would that remove that position from the Auburn Public Library, a councillor position? No, actually, so there could be conflicts. What we want to do, and one of the reasons we have two city councillors on this, is to avoid having three, which would then be a meeting. Gotcha. So if we're appointing Councillor Boss to the Auburn Public Library, the chances of her being the chair of the Auburn Public uh, Library Board is minimal. And if she was, um, and she was also appointed as a City Council representative to the board itself, I would highly recommend to Councillor Boss that she would have another alternate um, be, it, represent the chair in her stead. That way it would give probably a little extra voice to that board from the library standpoint. So no, it's not meant to take away. Um, it's only meant to complement and deconflict the potential to have multiple or three counselors on one board at one time. Questions? I got, uh, you, you got here, it says a reduction from 21 members across four, uh, down to se seven, active will you explain that more to me yeah in the parentheses so let me go to the next slide where councillor walker is let's talk about the board configuration benefits okay um bullet one increased coordination streamlined communication to and from the city council clearing house for non-governmental organizations financial and staff support some might need staff support this is a great clearing house for that if need be increased clarity in mission and vision Shifting from subcommittees to working group allows for greater public participation that suits their interests and city need to go. We talked about it a little bit, but when we have a working group, that members of the working group do not have to be part of the committee or go through the process. They can be used on an ad hoc basis based upon the mission of that working group and the finite amount of time needed in order to pull off the Thanksgiving dinner. Okay, So this allows people to participate without going through the application process when their schedule permits. Parks has been shifted from conservation to recreation. Greater insight for council on status and progression of boards. Because there'll be counselors um, on the boards, they can report up actions that are needed to be reported back up to the greater council through the communication section of our regularly scheduled meeting. <clears throat> Increased consistency in meetings. Reduction of 21 members across four committees to seven members. Um, acting on behalf of three committees and one subcommittee. That's just in the regulatory process. The first slide that we looked at, Councillor, just there. We consolidated there, which is consolidating the number of appointments that are needed and the amount of folks um, that are on boards that actually don't meet except very, very rarely. We, we will just need to adjust that a little bit. One thing we didn't do is we didn't change those numbers after we brought the CDBG loan committee back out of that yep. so once we put them back in that number of 21 reduction will actually change this again when we're going to talk about next steps in a second there is a very significant amount of work that's already gone into this but that needs to go into this too um, legal work as well as just organization and org chart work too but we wanted to make sure we're 80 90 percent there so to speak concept wise that you all were on board with directional so we could continue our work um, and then consistent committee charges and make up for simplicity and efficiency. I guess my direct question is, the age-friendly committee, are we reducing it to, from what we are to, to whatever number? No. Doesn't change. Um, we're not. Now, going forward, if the council wants to look at conforming and making membership conformities on, con uh, on committees for consistency, that's going to happen in next steps and I can't control what the council proposes in an amendment to an order, um, but let's talk about next steps, shall we? So with council's review and approval to move forward, which is happening tonight, 
Execution of the ordinance modification and deconflicting with legal support needs to happen. That's going to be a process. Um, and that means looking at everything that we've talked about here, role playing even further what potential conflicts could be and how they can be deconflicted, and to make sure that everything in our ordinances are changed so that they're legal. Um, next would be a revised ordinance presented to city council review and vote. Ideally, goal would be for a January 1, you know, no later than, though that might be a little tight considering our current schedule is pretty full. In 2021, a launch process to review remaining multi-jurisdictional committees and boards. This is the joint committees and boards um, that we have with the Lewiston City Council. That might necessitate a joint council meeting between Auburn and Lewiston, and a further negotiation between staff um, on all process for all joint functions. For example, law pack, okay, uh, the airport, 911. There's a lot of joint um, organizations that council or myself or staff are represented on, represent the city of Auburn on, um, that involve financial decisions. They all need to be looked at, obviously, because they all interplay with one another. So that is going to be a longer process, just to let you know, kind of separate from this, because remember, these are committees that we control. These are committees that are within our ordinance, our charter. Um, and then next, be with all committee chairs. This is very important to discuss the potential changes and charge to deconflict work between committees and refocus on city needs. You know, Councilor Walker, you're the acting chair, you're the chair of the Age Friendly Committee, so you have that benefit of being here right now asking these questions with a mindset of your chairmanship, not just necessarily as a counselor. Okay, so we want to give that same opportunity to other chairs and members of other committees to see how this will affect them and what their mission is. And then retain um, appointment opportunities to currently observe, excuse me, currently observed by the mayor, city council, school board, and chair. We want to preserve some of that legacy <coughs> appointment uh, process in order to keep the legacy knowledge flowing, policy, and elected officials' hands uh, versus just solely an appointed. Um, and one other thing, too, I'm not sure if it was noted, when we talked about compensation for planning board, um, done some research. Uh, just as today, for example, I talked to a municipality similar size and configuration in southern Maine, outside of Portland. Um, the pay for the planning board was proposed to be $25 per meeting per member, with the chair uh, receiving $30 per meeting. Uh, that is right in line with a lot of other municipalities, or or lower than most. It is definitely not higher than any of them. So right now we're the lowest at zero. Uh, but the trend has been for a while to compensate uh, planning board members, as well as actually Board of Appeals, Board of Assessment Reviews. There are certain cities in Maine that compensate anybody if they're appointed for something just for time. Um, I'm not, I don't <coughs> think this committee, we didn't go into that de de detail on that. That would be a discussion and debate for a latter point in time. But as far as planning board goes, we do recommend $25 per meeting for members and $30 for the chair per meeting. So um, with that, Questions? Councilor uh, um, you, you mentioned, I think, uh, also compensating school, school board members. Is that in con under consideration as well? Not in this charge. It wasn't part of our mission statement. That would be with, your, with um, the charter review. Come on, questions. This is a great time for me to be on this side. I, I just had one question about the community advisory board. Is there room in there for a school committee member as well, or does that also be a staff to staff type thing? Because I think that community involvement, or excuse me, the community advisory board would also have a lot to do with the school and, and the quality of life type issues. I'm sorry, I'll turn that over to Councilor Gary or Matt or Councilor Boss. Thoughts? I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think we should add it to the list of things that we consider. And of course, you're going to have to talk to the, you know, the chair of the school board as well on that too. But um, there's definitely some synergy there. Mm. Any other questions? None? I had one more question. Are, of all the consolidation we're doing, are all of those currently filled vacancies? Are all those currently filled seats that we're going to be eliminating? if we go through with this, or, or how many are not, if you know? Talk about, there. Well, we'll turn over to Sue here to answer that if we can, but Matt, you had a really good idea, and if you want to talk about how that would move that evolution once it's yeah. approved, if you would, yes. Right, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, so, if I remember what came out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> apparently it was well-reasoned and thought out. Um, 
I think what will happen is um, with the regulatory committee, or the advisory board, which is the one that's most um, affected by this, I think you just have to put a stop date to what is in place right now, and then you have to recreate the regulatory advisory board. There's no way. The other boards, if you wanted to change the size of any of the constituent of the of the actual existing boards of committees underneath an advisory board, you could do that just through time. But since you're creating a single entity and absorbing the functions of others with that regulatory board, you will have to at some point just say, okay, now we're creating this board, which means you have to end the other boards. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Could you tell me uh, with all the adjustments that you think you've done here, how many boards have you reduced? Or, uh, what is the time you've saved for the counselors that are on these boards already? I, mm -hmm. I don't see, I can't, personally can't see where you've saved a hell of a lot of time. Well, then you have to just look a little bit deeper in something that doesn't affect age friendly. Let me explain. You're going to love this one, counselor. I, 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 so I, I'll, I'll explain it to you. No, it's a great question. I'm going to re, I'm going to go through it. First of all, what you're doing is, and we have to look at the staff time separately. It's not my area of, of expertise, I'll turn that over to the assistant city manager and city manager, but just conceptually or anecdotally, all of a sudden instead of a round robin or continuous flow of applications um, that are coming into Sue's office, there's going to be two primary open windows in which the applications are going to come in, they'll be then sent out to the appointment committee. The time saved over, and Sue please jump in, do you see based upon all of our conversations a significant savings or not savings in time on your end from this? as proposed and maybe give us a little bit of an example no just for the um you know the regulatory advisory board yeah i mean reducing it from what is it 21 to down to seven and then only having to recruit twice a year assuming we fill those seven seats but mm -hmm. we could potentially have to recruit in between those those right. two times but even in, in general, with all the recruitment on two open enrollment periods, you see this as a significant time saving for your department? Absolutely, yes. Turn it over to the city manager and assistant city manager. Overall staff constraints or staff uh, utilization of staff time. But is this going to be a financial benefit, more efficient utilization of staff time? Well, I think one thing that we'll need to work through is should staff be assigned to more of the advisory board or the individual uh, committees? And I really think it's towards the advisory board. And then through that process, then those chairs can talk about what staff resources are needed, and we could schedule and manage our time a little better than we have right now. Currently, we have some staff members that sit in a committee meeting, um, and they have no participation. The committee is meeting, they're doing their business, uh, but the staff has no participation. So uh, waiting for that request or to then take that information back if need be. So, so that's where we see benefit. Um, being consistent and trying to move all these boards and committees uh, in the same direction. Council Walker, I think, you know, to your point, uh, there's probably some future recommendations of boards and committees. I don't think it was mentioned, but the arts and culture uh, committee came from the strategic planning process. That's currently in there with kind of dash marks around it as a future board that might be established under the community advisory board. Um, so certainly not eliminating because one of the charges uh, that was provided was how to increase citizen engagement and so um, so we didn't eliminate boards and committees uh, but more how can we increase their engagement and have them be more uh, part of the process that goes to uh, one of the regulatory boards where sometimes we appoint someone they will complete their entire term and never do any work um, being on the regulatory they will have something that most likely that they'll be able to do at least once a quarter uh, so that gets them more engaged and more involved. Councilor Zanya. Um, another small thing, the school building committee is under the school committee, so that doesn't show up here. Now, and to, to talk about Councilor Walker's uh, reduction of councilor time, yes and no. Most of the councilor outside of council meeting time is spent on intergovernmental appointments by the mayor, staff, as needed transportation, school board, school building committee, and so forth. That's got to be a next step to look at. 
Um, but what this does do is it helps the council be in touch with multiple committees in a very efficient manner. So that can be better time management. Instead of being deep down in each individual committee, you're a little bit higher up and have more of a say in specific areas. So there is some, there is some helpful there, but some of this will evolve and frankly, you, we all have to think that how th this will fit not just this council or mayor, but the next one and the one after that and the one after that. The hardest adoption problem will be with this council and mayor on any change. Um, it will be significantly, hopefully, if we do our job correctly, easier going forward. Any other questions? No, I, I, but I got a comment. I, uh, I respect you coming forward with the $25 thing for the planning board. But I don't think it's our job or your planning board job, whatever you want to call your title here, to be requesting $25 per person on a planning board. I think it should have been up to their chair to come to this council and explain why they feel they should be paid $25. Very, very good point. He actually, I, I brought this up personally when he wasn't here. Who's he? Matt Duvall, the chair of the planning board. To my right? Yeah. I made sure that he was on vacation before I brought this, I broached his subject. Well, I'm telling wanna... you my opinion. I don't think oh. we should have done that. Just like our council wanted to give all councilors a raise, they brought it in front mm -hmm. of us like they should have, and that's the way it should work in this city. Then that's to me, not to them. Uh, this not to this, no, this that, was that. a review of other things, not money. It was how to modernize it, and I take full responsibility because I believe that their time was valuable and they should be compensated. Um, so that's My on time me. is too, but I volunteer for many things. I don't ask for no that's money. That's you, Councillor Walker. Absolutely. I listen. That's right. I'm and not here to debate the pros and cons. They did not ask for any money, and that isn't your place or mine to ask for money for them. I do believe it is my place. I don't. And that's fine. We have two dis dis differing agreements. I believe that their time is valuable, and I believe that $25 in today's day to bring us up to speed is valuable. Now, this will come forth in an ordinance. There'll be several different chunks of different ordinance changes for everybody to debate the merits of each individual line item. We have Robert's rules to guide us on amendments to those ordinances, and you can vote them up or you can vote them down. You know, that, and we can debate the merits, and I think we should all debate the merits in the future when this comes up, and that's one of them. Um, but it's something to think about. Is there anything else? We have, we have, I don't know how many other groups here that have meetings. You got one that's the street group, then we probably should ask that we give them $25 for every meeting they sit in. You can, you can propose and, that when we have we the have, ordinance on the floor. And we have uh, quite a few others that, I mean, if you think the city has got money to just give away, then we should oh. give everybody $100. Well, Councilor Walker, I will, night. Oh, with all due respect, I will not allow words to be put in my mouth. I said exactly what I meant, and I meant what I say. I believe the planning board's time, their effort, and their amount of thoughtfulness and legal review is warranting of compensation at the tune of $25 per member per month and $30 to the chair. If you so think that other chairs, or excuse me, committees are deserving of additional money, you can propose that during uh, the charter review or during the ordinance debate on this topic. But I will stand by what I said and what I said only. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? No, very good. Then I think uh, we're going to close this workshop and we're going to get back on the city business. Mr. Duvall, thank you very much for your time for coming in thank tonight. Thank you all. Okay. Okay. okay, moving on. Uh, there are no consent items on tonight's agenda. Next, we have the minutes of the October 5th, 2020 regular council meeting. Are there any corrections? None being, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the October 5th, 2020 regular council meeting. Second. Uh, motion by Councillor Milks and a second by Councillor McLeod. I'm um, going to ask for a show of hands, or excuse me, a vote by a show of hands. All those in favor? Unanimous. Vote of 7 0. Next, we're going to move on to communications, presentations, and recognition. Uh, first, we have a Maine Town and City Managers Association, or MTCMA, award presentation. For this, the city manager and myself will go across to the community room for this presentation. Uh, Council, you can watch on the big screen right here, and I believe you'll be able to hear us and everything as well. Okay?
Testing, testing. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, first, what I would ask is uh, for our former city manager, Peter Creighton, to come. We have a uh, presentation of a, an award uh, for Reagan Young, and Peter has a few words. Thank you, Manager Kroll. Very nice to see you. I don't see you often enough these days. I don't see a lot of the folks that I was comfortable and happy to see on a regular basis. I am really pleased to be able to be here this evening. Uh, over th three years ago, I took the position here with the City of Auburn and said it was a great privilege and honor. It is equally a great privilege and honor to be here tonight uh, to recognize uh, Reagan Young, uh, who was an intern in the city manager's office for a period of February of 2020 to about June of 2020 or so. Uh, it really was a pleasure for all of us to, to work with Reagan. Uh, she was in the city manager's office. She worked with myself. She worked with Phil Kroll. She worked with Liz Allen. She worked with Kelsey Earl. She worked with the whole team, uh, including department directors and other folks, and did a remarkable job. Uh, I asked Phil to send me the uh, information that I had submitted uh, for the award on behalf of our, our team. and. I was reminded that your GPA was uh, 3.97 uh, from the graduate program at the Muskie School for the MPPM. Uh, my goodness. Um, you parents uh, must just love uh, watching your daughter uh, as she grows and matures and the things that she does are remarkable. Uh, she was the person who wrote a uh, report on the recycling program, uh, did a wonderful job, worked with Phil on that and, and other folks. Uh, she also helped us establish a more formal program for our internships in the future, and also uh, an internship program that the city is hoping to launch with the high school uh, for both Auburn and Lewiston, and uh, was involved in a lot of ways, um, participated in our leadership team meetings, and. Uh, she was well accepted by everybody on the team. So it's great to have you here, Reagan, and to be able to recognize you. I know that the mayor and the city council all appreciated uh, the work that you did. And we certainly know that we need young people coming into the profession of public administrators. I'm grateful to have a number of my colleagues here uh, from the awards committee uh, who uh, made a great decision uh, in selecting you for the Edward F. Dow Scholarship Award. I know uh, they're going to make some comments in a moment. Uh, we have here Rhonda Irish, who is the uh, incoming president for the Maintown City County Management Association. Uh, Andy Hart, who's the outgoing president. Uh, and Ryan Pelletier, uh, who serves on the board, past president of the Maine Municipal Association, is a county administrator from Rooster County. Uh, where I grew up, uh, and Scott Morelli, who's an active member of the board, who's the city manager of South Portland. So uh, I'm really pleased to see all of you here. And at this point in time, I'm going to turn the mic over to Andy, I think, uh, for some comments. Andy Hart. Good evening, uh, Honorable Mayor and members of the council. Thank you for having us tonight. We appreciate it very much. Um, I just want to give a little background on the Dow Award. Uh, the Edward F. Dow Award is presented by MTCMA to honor and recognize Dr. Dow's lifelong accomplishments and exceptional career and dedication to the public administration profession. This award is presented annually to a person studying public administration 
who has already made a significant contribution to the profession and has demonstrated noteworthy leadership skills during the course of his or her studies and early participation in public administration work. This year's award goes to Reagan Young, who graduated this past May from the Muskie School of Public Service with a master's degree in policy, planning, and management. She worked as an intern for the City of Auburn and was able to accomplish a number of significant initiatives and deliverables during her time there, some related to the challenges and opportunities that resulted from the pandemic. According to Peter Crichton and Phil Crowell, who nominated her for this award, Reagan is a remarkable person who is wise beyond her years. Reagan's goal is to help rural traditional towns think bigger and more creatively, and we are lucky that Reagan wants to do this here in Maine. Congratulations, Reagan, and good luck to you in all your future endeavors. Would you please come up? So I'd like to read this special yeah. award for you. Uh, it says, Maine Town City and County Management Association, Dr. Edward F. Dow Student Award presented to Reagan Young, a future leader in the public sector of government and in recognition of her noteworthy scholastic achievements in the Maine School of Public Service, October 2021. Well, Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, Honorable Mayor and Council, I just wanted to take this moment to say thank you to the city staff of Auburn. Um, you folks were honestly the perfect stepping stone between my graduate career and my professional career. Um, I, you know, I think as everybody ends graduate school a little bit concerned about what they're about to dive into, Auburn was really the perfect um, sort of step into this world and you really solidified the fact that I knew I wanted to do this work and do it in Maine. So thank you all and thank you for traveling to come present this award. So. Okay, if I could have um, Rhonda and Ryan and Scott come up, please. So since Peter stole my thunder to introduce uh, my co-board uh, members to the right, um, I don't have to do that now. Um, I just would add that um, I appreciate Peter correcting the title for our association. Um, he left the most important county part out. Um, and I just want to mention my day job, um, I am currently the president. I have 10 days left for Maine Town and City Manager Association. and then. Um, Rhonda will become the president. I'll be the past president. Uh, during the day, I'm the county, administ county administrator for Knox County in Rockland. So um, I was in municipal government for quite a few years prior to that. So I do have a, a mix of both. And Peter can relate to that because he has as well. And um, I appreciate all the uh, wisdom and good words you've given me through the years as well. So um, without further ado, I'd like to have Peter come up here, please, so we can present him award. So if you'd come up. <laughs> um, so I would like to, I'm going to initially, I'm going to present you and tell you what you're receiving and then I have a little bit to read, so. All right. But we'll get right to the, okay. the good stuff. So it is my honor this year and with the members of the board that are present, uh, the entire executive board and the association for the main town and city county management association to present you with the 2020 Link Stack Poll Manager of the Year Award. Oh my so, congratulations. This is why I didn't get that much information. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I need that one. This is the one after. You're actually getting a two for it tonight. So. <laughs> Um, Rookie of the year? <laughs> nope. So I'm going to read this one first. Uh, so this is presented to City of Auburn in the recognition of Link Stat Poll Manager of the Year, Peter Crichton, by the Maine Town City and County Management Association, October 2020. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Congratulations. Right. Yeah. 
Um, so I'm going to read a little bit, if you don't mind waiting while I read this, because there are some good points in here I have to hit. Um, just a little background again on the Link Statpole Award. Uh, Link Statpole was a town manager of Machias in the 70s. He served on many municipal committees and boards. He was highly respected and admired for his dedication to his community, his management abilities, and his overall contributions to the profession. Each year, the Link Stackpole Award is given to someone who exemplifies those same ideals. Um, and then I'm going to go on a little bit about Peter to give you some background on his career. Um, Peter achieved a master's in public administration from the University of Maine and had the unique opportunity to intern with Senator Muskie in Washington, D.C. as part of his education. He credits this opportunity with his education to pursue municipal management as his life's work. He viewed his ed education at UMaine as a critical foundation for his work, and as a result, he has lobbied the university to retain the public administration program so that future municipal leaders will be able to access proper training in public management. Peter has dedicated 35 years of his life to public service, starting his career as the first economic community development director for his hometown of Myers Hills in Aroostook County. Moving south was, was next for him in his position with Public Works Administrator, then Assistant City Manager for Lewiston, serving there the city for 10 years. From there, he was Administrator for Cumberland County for 18 years. And he concluded his career spending the past three years as Auburn City Manager. Peter, Peter retired the end of June. In addition to the significant contributions Peter made to the organizations he worked for, perhaps his greatest impact has been his tireless dedication to provide encouragement to Maine's future municipal leaders. In addition to working hard to maintain and grow <coughs> UMaine's public administration program, he has served on a national, state, and regional initiatives to develop young leaders. As a board member of the USM Muskie Institute, Peter sought opportunities to match master's program candidates with internships in local government. He also served on the MTCMA board of directors, including a term as its president, and he received the MTCMA Leadership Award in 2003. It's quite, quite, a, quite an accomplishment. Peter has been a member of ICMA for over 32 years and served as chairman of the Northeast Vice Chair Selection Committee, along with membership on a number of committees and forums. Most significantly, over many years, Peter has welcomed and mentored countless individuals as they began to advance their careers in municipal government. The awards nomination submitted for Peter were, were, for, were outstanding, and since I can't say it better than those who know him best, I want to share some of their sentiments. These are just a few excerpts from the nominations. According to one nomination, Peter's reputation for integrity and thoughtful leadership is impeccable and widely known. His diplomatic approach to management has earned the respect of his peers, employees, and citizens alike. He's an insightful, intuitive leader who values civility and respect as cornerstones of municipal governance. And his ability to see all sides of an issue only adds to his credibility. He is an adept at building consensus, building relationships, and not only listening, but truly hearing. Another nomination stated, Peter is a compassionate and caring person, ready to find solutions to issues or problems no matter how difficult. The county and the communities he has worked for are better off from his service. And lastly, one person added, Peter is a transformational leader. He is dedicated to community engagement, has been an agent of change in Maine's local government. Peter consistently advocates for community involvement in every process, and he strives to ensure that everyone has a voice and place at the table. And just to sum it up, um, this is a quote that I actually gave um, to Phil as well. Uh, Peter is a humble public servant who does not seek rec recognition for his service, but we cannot think of a municipal leader who is more deserving of this award. Congratulations again, Peter. And I do have one just last award that I'd like to present to Peter. Um, this is the MTCMA Life Membership, and this is presented to Peter Crichton in recognition of your outstanding service, dedication to the Maine Town and City County Management Association, October 2021. All right. This, this Peter, is a gift from Aristotle County. I, I recognize the chips. <laughs> we got, we got yeah. an authentic Stewart yeah. Farms potato basket. We got some Labrie Farm potatoes, some Bouchard Ploy mix, some Fox great. family chips, That's and some Aroostook County swag. So. <coughs> Thank you very much. There you go.
Well, those of you who know me know that I'm usually not very shy about saying things. But um, I am really taken back by this. Um, Phil and, and Kelsey and Liz came to our house um, to have lunch with Jen and I probably a month or so ago. We've been trying to set it up for quite a while. And um, Phil and Kelsey and, and Liz gave me a, a gift, um, which was very nice of them. They didn't have to do that. On the gift, there's a quote from Walt Disney, and those of you who know me know I love going to Disney World. <laughs> I really do. And I, and I admire Walt Disney very much um, for what he accomplished. And the quote is um, something like this. I don't know if I'm going to remember it exactly, but it's about team effort and working together. And it says, whatever we accomplish, belongs to our entire group. It's a tribute to a combined effort, to our combined effort. And the mayor is telling me I'm not close enough. Um, thank you, Mayor, for watching out for me. Um, this is a representation of the, the people that I've worked with in my career. Um, all of us as managers, all of us in the work that we do um, in local government, elected officials as well, recognize that you cannot be successful um, without a combined effort of people uh, who are working with you, who are talented, who are capable. Um, there's a term that it's hard to fly like an eagle when you fly with turkeys. Um, and it's true. Um, I've always tried to surround myself with the best people that I can, people who are smarter than I am, uh, who are uh, dedicated and capable and enthusiastic and passionate, and I've been very blessed that way. Um, with uh, the people that I've worked with closely um, and the elected officials as well. I've been very fortunate in my career. Being in Auburn over the last three years was a great way for me to be able to um, put a ribbon or a bow on my career. Um, this is a great team that you have here in Auburn. And I miss the, uh, the camaraderie and, and working with folks um, like Phil and, and Kelsey and Liz and, and all of you, Karen and, and Brian and, and all the staff, Joe, um, and the elected officials too. Um, Auburn is poised to do uh, even greater things in the future, and I expect that you will. And if there's something I can do to help, I certainly will. I appreciate my colleagues being here. I appreciate this, this uh, distinct honor. Uh, I was not expecting this. Uh, and uh, if there's something I can do uh, to help the profession, I certainly will uh, continue to do that as long as I possibly can. So. Uh, thank you very, very much. Phil, thank you. Uh, and Jennifer, <laughs> don't, don't ever say uh, that uh, I'm the only one who can keep a secret, okay? Thank you, everyone, very, very much. Thank you. This is wonderful. Yeah, well... You want to say something? I, we flipped the coin. All right. I, I, I lost. I mean, well, <laughs> but one thing I do want to. One thing, I mi God, I missed you. We had so much fun. <laughs> we really did. Um, You've got the I, better me right now. I know you recorded half those conversations for prosperity, <laughs> too. So. Um, just really quick congratulations, Peter. Everything is well earned. I mean, you. your career is just an envy of many. Even outside of your industry, the fact that what you've accomplished in leadership and in building up a future generations is just, it's amazing and it is an inspiration. Uh, one thing I never was able to do was give you one of our limited edition solid fake gold mm -hmm. mayor's coin for 150th. I had every uh, thought of doing it when you retired, but COVID got in the way. So yep. I'm very, very happy to give that to you now. Thank you very and, much. Uh, no, thank, thank you, you very much for everything and all the leadership you've given the city on behalf of the staff. Really, it is truly a blessing to have you. So thank, thank you. you very and much. Jen. 
thank you for letting him do what he did. So. Thank you. Pictures at this point, I'll let you do that while we move along with our meeting. If that's pictures? Yeah. I'll take double. Oh, please, please, please. We'll be getting under one. Do you need to stand? Do you need to stand? Does that mean you don't mind? Okay, so I, I got to make, make one more award because I actually made a mistake. That's the first one I've made, actually, but <laughs> no, it isn't. Um, so uh, the award that I originally read was for the city. Uh, Peter, your award is right behind you. But now I need to present the award to the mayor because I presented your award, uh, the city's award to you. But your award's right there. So, so I'm going to represent this if that's okay. If you're okay with that. So um, this one is presented to the city of Auburn in recognition of the Link Stack Poll Manager of the Year, which is Peter Crichton. Um, this is by the Maine Town City Management Association in October 2020. This is for the city, presented to the mayor, um, and can be hung in City Hall to show the recognition um, that. Peter is the manager of the year. So. Or in the mayor's office. Or in the mayor's yeah, office, right. Yeah. Very good. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. You're Thank welcome. you for coming down here. Oh, really, you. all of you. I mean, it's an honor for having to have all of you come down to Auburn um, and do this for Peter, do this for the city. Really, I can't express my thanks enough. And please come again later and spend money. So, uh, we'd appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Are we, is our audio live on air right now? Okay, very good. We're going to move this along, actually, since we have this going in the back room. I'm going to open this up. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to go through council communications before we launch the next workshop. So. Bear with us one second. I just want to make sure we get the, the video feed cut back over to us, Brian. So he donated $3. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take some. That's great. Always look up straight. He'll run in. So those of you at home, just bear with us one second. We're, we've got a new reality we're dealing with in the audiovisual world. So we're moving that audio and visual back to council chambers. Okay, um, let's get, start off with communications. I'd like to start off with Councilor Large, Katie Boss. Do you have any communications for the uh, for the city? Um, thank you, Councilor Walker. Yes, we're going to have uh, Halloween in New Auburn. It's going to be at the New Anniversary Park, and it will be October thirty first, one to three o'clock. Kids will come in by the bell tower, clock tower and they will enter through the walk and driveway, the road, and they will trick-or-treat as they exit out into the huge parking lot next to Broad Street. Also, we are going to put on the uh, age-friendly committee. I'm going to put on a Thanksgiving dinner again this year. It will be a stop and go. You'll have to call in your orders. It's going to be, of course, Thanksgiving Day, November 26th. But you only have until Friday, November 20th, to call your order in for your dinner. Now, your dinner will, uh, you know, be the uh, total Thanksgiving dinner. But just so you know, and you don't get upset with us, we are not going to do desserts this year. Uh, we just feel that it's more than we can take on and package up. But all you have to do is uh, give us a donation of any amount you want and call in, please. Your donation will be the day you pick up your dinner. Take it home. Uh, you can order more than one. You can order for a whole family. But again, Thanksgiving, register with 
the uh, recreation, and they'll give you an extension once you call down there. So just call the city line and please order. And we're only going to go up to 200. At 200, we cut it off. So if you want a dinner, please order it. You can start ordering tomorrow if you'd like. Thank you very much. Councilor Milks? Not reports. Communication, right? Communications. None Not reports. None at this time. Okay, very much. Councilor Lasagna? Nothing at this time. Councilor uh, Nothing yet. Councilor Gary? The mayor. The city's or grab and go program is going strong. If anybody that's a senior or family needs some groceries, give the rec department a call. And if you're a senior, talk to Jamie or Sean and they'll fix you up with a box. We've helped many seniors get the food that they need, as well as families. And I can say that the meals that I have been delivering, or the boxes rather, have been greatly appreciated. And they wanted me to give a special thanks to the team that puts them together and for the generosity of the city for letting this continue. Councilor Carey? Nothing at this time. Bring it back to myself. There's two uh, communications I'd like to make. Uh, first communications is on our next meeting, I'll be presenting to you an order that will take revenues acquired by the city of, from tax acquired properties after fees, back taxes, administrative um, fees have been assessed to that, the Delta to go into an enterprise account. The enterprise account will be dedicated towards eliminating or helping those that are economically disadvantaged um, remove blight from their property. So instead of the money going into the general fund, the money will go directly to an account that will help uh, property owners within the city of Auburn at the direction of the city manager and economic community development with regards to distribution of that. Um, that order will come out next meeting so we can look at that. Um, that is the case uh, and it's something that, that came to me um, through talks with constituents about what do we do with that extra money on top of the minimum. For example, if we put a minimum bid for $20,000 for a property, but through sealed bid process, that property brings in 50,000, where does the additional $30,000 go, the Delta? I wanna make sure that it's earmarked for the betterment of housing stock within our city. Okay. Second announcement I'd like to make is that actually next meeting as well, um, or excuse me, by the end of the meeting, or excuse me, the second meeting in November, I'm sorry, at the end of the month, um, I'm very happy to announce that I'll be awarding the first mayoral award um, for Mayor John Jenkins. This award will go to an individual or group in Auburn that, have, that has had a, mom, a positive impact on the mental or physical health of the city or individuals within the city. I think it's a fitting way to honor his tribute. I've talked to the city manager about this. With full disclosure, it was his idea. Uh, I loved it. I'm going to make it great. It was a great idea, though. Um, you're welcome. We're going to have, and we're working on the design of this, there will be an award going out to that individual or group for them to take. There will also be a permanent uh, reminder of this within City Hall, um, the announcement of the award in memory of John Jenkins and little placards for every year that this award is awarded on, on behalf of him. So I just want to let you know it's something that I think is a, a very fitting tribute um, to the former mayor. And I think uh, considering his past history, uh, promoting physical health and mental wellness within the city, it's very fitting. So those are my two communication uh, topics right now. And we'll move it on to the city manager. Mr. Manager, do you have anything under communications? Not under communication, but under reports. Very good, then. We're going to actually pick up our last, our last workshop item of the night, which is housing code. Uh, this is going to be with Eric Cousins. Eric, is Chris with you as well, or is it going to be you running solo on this? Chris is not going to be here tonight. Very good, then. If all is going well, he's almost to his septic tank by now with a shovel, so he just he couldn't make it tonight. Well, better him. Better him than us. Very <laughs> I'd good. I'd be here. Um, over time, we've asked the council to make some changes to our housing code. Um, in 2016, we had proposed some pretty substantial changes to the housing code. Um, some of those had passed, uh, not all of them. And with all of the discussion that we've been having about attracting new residents and improving housing stock, uh, staff thought it was time to consider uh, one in particular that we don't have that really makes it difficult to deal with some of the concerns that the council has been expressing about uh, downtown housing. Um, 
really blight and uh, poor maintenance. Um, poorly maintained buildings um, certainly impact the uh, actions of the surrounding property owners. If somebody sees a poorly maintained building, they feel impacted by it, they're less apt to invest in their buildings. Um, poor housing quality uh, makes it harder to attract, re attract residents to a particular neighborhood um, and reduces demand for people to move to that neighborhood and, and really kind of spirals and contributes to a downward um, downward uh, falling condition in the neighborhood. Uh, one building by itself does not sit there without impacting surrounding buildings. Uh, much like uh, management um, of a building, if a building is poorly managed, um, has trash problems, nuisance noise, pervasive criminal activity, um, it certainly affects the behavior of other residents in the neighborhood and again affects people's perception of that neighborhood and reduces demand for for living in that neighborhood either neighborhood either because it's perceived as uh, not safe or poorly maintained or unpleasant um, we're looking to do a couple of things uh, in adjusting the ordinance slightly um, to better address deteriorating paint um, is a very common violation that's difficult for us to deal with right now until you see actual structural damage from a property. Um, by defining paint stabilization, uh, meaning repairing any physical defect in the substrate of a painted surface that is causing paint deterioration, removing loose paint and other material, and applying a new protective coating or paint to the affected area, defining that but then also requiring on any buildings that are pre-1978 uh, construction that that surface area where the deterioration exists, that that also be repaired, um, that it be stabilized. This doesn't mean if there's flaking paint that somebody has to paint their whole house. It really means that the area that's affected, the area that's deteriorated, uh, needs to be stabilized, either or either surface coated, um, loose paint removed, and a proper coating put on it. This can go a long ways to um, making buildings look better from the outside. It also indirectly reduces the chance of lead poisoning in children. And it also gives people access to our CDBG spot program where these conditions exist and other violations don't exist. Um, it does open the door that we could use CDBG loans to help address those conditions. So it's not purely an enforcement effort. Um, but it also opens up access to some of the CDB, CDBG funds. Uh, when a violation exists, we can use CDBG funds to help remedy that violation. There's really not a lot of buildings um, that are very poorly maintained left in Auburn. Um, unfortunately, they tend to be concentrated, and I think it's partly because of their effect on each other. Um, they start to bring down the neighborhood as there becomes more than one uh, deteriorated building. So we're looking to make that change, also to add um, countertops and floors to the surfaces that have to be properly maintained uh, within buildings. Um, countertops and floors are more cosmetic, um, but they make a big deal, a big difference as far as being able to clean them, sanitize them, and the overall appearance of a unit and its desirability. And we're hoping to couple that with, um, currently, uh, we're quite often following up on a complaint, seeing the unit that has a problem that we have a complaint on, and dealing with any exterior violations that we see. Um, but we're back at the same building uh, a month later, dealing with an issue in a different unit, um, or dealing with trash at the unit. And um, the buildings that have frequent complaints and frequent documented violations, we're proposing and we're hoping that the council would support doing this. Um, because I think we can be much more effective with the public support of the council standing behind us in our efforts to do this. If we have properties where we have multiple verified code complaints, so if one tenant makes a complaint and we go out there, or many complaints and we go out and determine that the, the complaint is unwarranted, uh, we're not proposing that that would trigger any additional inspections. But if we have multiple complaints that are verified within 12 months, um, that we also have exterior evidence of blight or lack of maintenance, that we have higher than average emergency call volumes at a property, um, that we would trigger a full building inspection. So we can get into all the units 
and try to clean up that property that's really having a higher incidence of complaints and lack of maintenance than the rest of the neighborhood. Um, so that, that condition, um, that um, the behaviors that cause that, the conditions are corrected so that they don't bring down the rest, the rest of the neighborhood. Um, we don't have a lot of buildings uh, that make up a significant number of our code complaints, but there are a half a dozen to a dozen um, that take up a lot of time for repeat violations. Um, we can certainly give you exact examples of those um, at a future council meeting. Um, one in particular that we just pulled the numbers on had, uh, you know, upwards of 15 complaints in a year from the code enforcement perspective. And that same building had over 100 police calls in the last couple of years, police or emergency calls. They really do go hand in hand where poorly maintained buildings attract a lot of behavior that affects uh, the community. So uh, we're hoping you're open to the idea and uh, we're happy to give you concrete examples and we think it can be much more effective if it's um, put out there publicly that we're taking this seriously and we're going to address blight in our, in our neighborhoods um, so that it doesn't spread. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Milks. This has been an issue that's been near and dear to you for quite some time. You've been very vocal about it. And then Councillor Boss. I uh, thank you. I liked it. I, I think that's a really positive move. I think it's going to affect um, children in our neighborhoods because I think ultimately it's the kids that don't have a voice are the ones that are, are really dramatically affected by these these houses that have the hundred calls in a year. So I'm 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 very much supportive of something like this. Councilor Boss? I also voice my support for these changes that have been proposed. I think it's really critical for the health and wellness of the community. And then also I think it's a really prudent approach to dealing with properties that do have multiple calls and that are taking a lot of staff time. Like get at the root cause of the issue, find out what's happening in that building and make improvements that are needed. So I'm fully in support of what's being proposed and thank you for these changes. Councilors? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Zani. Sure, um, in terms of paint stabilization, it, you mentioned uh, lead. Is there some aspect of this where code would be looking specifically for lead to make sure that obviously not doing an abatement, but that is contained through new paint? The, um, the pre-78 standard is one that's widely accepted in, in federal standards, um, and it really ties the flaking paint back to the likelihood that there actually is a physical hazard uh, at the property. Um, it's harder to say that in a post-78 building that isn't likely to have lead. Um, so we looked at a couple of different standards. The last time we talked to the council, we didn't differentiate between that. And there was concern that um, we would find some flaking paint and make somebody paint their whole house and that there really wasn't a hazard, but it was more of an aesthetic issue. Um, so we've tried to sort of incrementally um, to address the safety part of it by, by just limiting this to pre-78 housing, which, which most of our downtown is pre-78 housing. Um, much of our housing stock in the older neighborhoods is pre-78. So I think it, it addresses the majority of the problem and it's truly the properties where the lead paint is a hazard for, for somebody, a health hazard. And it's not a lead, you, you don't have sort of a lead safe protocol, you just want them to paint over what is there. So in, in pre-78 housing, there's a limited surface area that can be done without a lead safe um, renovator uh, being present. Um, we'd have to look at each case. There will be cases if there's widespread deterioration where it does require a lead safe, lead smart or lead safe renovator to do, to do the work. And we could detail that a little bit more um, if this comes back for an actual decision with the council. Um, another question. In terms of absent landlords, um, do you have, will there be good records? I'm assuming that these are probably not owner occupied, many of them. Maybe they are, but in terms of I'll making... Figures. We, we can pull the top 10 code case properties and, and, and run those through an address track for emergency services as well. Um, none of the ones that we've been dealing with lately um, that, are, that will be on that list are, are owner-occupied. Yeah. So I think it would be unusual to have one that is owner-occupied that is, is both poorly maintained and, and has rental units. And do you feel the city has pretty good contact information for these folks? Because that can be difficult at times. 
The, the most challenging ones are the ones that are going through a foreclosure. Um, we're dealing with one right now. We finally were able to reach the property owner of record. Um, they haven't paid their taxes for over 10 years. They thought the bank already took it. The bank hasn't foreclosed on it, but it's been paying their taxes. Um, and it's difficult to get action in that case. So we may be in front of you with, um, with an approach that puts the bank under pressure to either foreclose or, or give up the property. And I, one last one, I really appreciate what Councillor Milk says about the children and making sure that as this move forward that there are some resources or some kind of guidance for families with their children if there are evictions or it's, the, the housing is unsafe. When we, um, it's always, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Councillor Walker, you first. Yeah, I did. Uh, I agree with uh, Eric on everything he says. I just want to be very careful that if we're walking into a house that may be owned by a senior citizen that can't afford to have these things done, that in the end, even if she can't borrow money from us or whatever, that it doesn't come to the point where you either fix that front porch or you're out of the home. I don't want us to get into that kind of a push. So we gotta be very careful, I think, how we approach. And right now, I know most of it is, uh, like you said, it's not that. But if we get into one or two, and I can think of a couple that are out into the country area that you may not wanna walk on their front porch to get in, but, uh, and they, most of them live alone. So you're not going to get money from people that are only getting 600 bucks a month and trying to make a live, living from that. Well, I think, you know. and that's, and Councillor, Councillor, that's the reason I wanted to talk about that communication piece on using the excess from tax acquired property sales in order to put that into a fund to help those who are economically incapable of fixing blood on their property address those blight concerns. It actually helps them from a health and safety standpoint. It also helps them post-retirement to increase the value of their home in case they do need to liquidate that to put themselves or to take care of themselves in those later years. Um, and I think we need to look at that. I think if we, if we look at probably what's going to be in there, it's going to be enough to kickstart this program for the remainder of this fiscal year. Um, but it's something that we might want to fund or substitute in as, because when you own, and to segue in, when you own a problem and you're calling it out, um, you own that problem. And hence you have an obligation to provide solutions. We are implementing, a, if we pass this and take this on, we be implementing a citywide standard of aesthetics. And when you do that, um, you are obligated to provide the resources or at least the knowledge of the resources in order to be in compliance. Okay, when we come up to a situation where there is no rational or legitimate way for someone to be in compliance, and then we're put into a position of cause and effect or penalties. And to Councillor Walker's point, what are those penalties? How do they look, what do they look like on paper? Are they accruing? Um, and what is the final penalty per se? Is it city acquisition? I don't think anybody, it would be hard to swallow an acquisition of a property because of chipping paint, but there might be a reason why from the health and safety of the neighborhood that that acquisition might need to be necessary. I just like to make sure that's all spelled out in the ordinance, that we're looking at you know, the minor or the whole threshold of uh, potential actions. And again, how we can provide at least assistance or knowledge of assistance through community partners, through CDBG loans or grants and through city um, funds in order to make uh, compliance a reality. start off um okay very good and this actually ties in well i wanted to say this for city staff when you're mandating a certain requirement a, an aesthetics requirement there's also some give and take that needs to go on versus just layering in more and more regulations and ordinances by doing this you're you have the ability now to pull back on some of those permitting fees and needed permits that would address some aesthetic and outside of home situations that are actually gonna be covered under ordinance versus the need to charge a fee for a home visit. I wanna keep that in mind because this ordinance will um, kind of cover some of that. So by putting on a layer of regulation, I do hope that we can take off two, three, or more layers of regulation in order to simplify the life of the residents. Okay. So very good, is there any other questions? No? Okay, we're gonna move on. And out of workshop, a little puzzle fitting here today, but we're doing well, folks. We're going to move on the schedule. I'm going to 
actually open this up at this point to the first open session of the night. Um, Eric, could I ask you please to just look through the doors and see if there's anybody here for open session? Brian's going to put it up on the screen if somebody comes up. If there's anybody here for open session that would like to speak, please uh, approach the podium, give us your name and address, and please let me your remarks for three minutes. I don't believe there are. Okay, we'll be now closing this first open session. We're going to be moving on to unfinished business. We have Ordinance 06-1005-2020, adopting the new general assistance maximums. This is the second reading. I'll turn a motion at this time. Second. Uh, motion for Councillor Gary, second for Councillor Boss. Public, uh, is there any members of the public that would like to speak on this? I don't believe there were any members of the public over there. So we're going to bring it back to the Council. Council, concept, debate, discussion. Second reading, first one is a pass. I'll ask for a vote at this time. Roll call. Councillor McLeod? Yes. Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Okay, the order passes at second and final reading by a vote of 7 0. Now on a new business. Um, temporarily suspending. The sign ordinance. It's order 124-10192020. Temporarily suspending uh, the temporary sign ordinance. I'll entertain a motion at this time. So moved. Second. Councilor McLeod, second by Councilor Walker. All of this up to the public. Is there anybody in the public that would like to comment? None being, I'll bring it back to the council. Council, any debate? Concern? Councilor uh, Lasagna. Just a question. Um, in some of the pictures that we showed of signs, some of them were sort of sagging and hanging down. I mean, do we get concerned about that. I appreciate that we need to let them go longer and I appreciate the parameters that you've laid out and how important it is, but there's nothing about just general appearance. I think at this point during the middle of a pandemic and a crisis, I think communication is paramount importance. Second would be followed up with keeping their business going. Third would probably be signs. I don't want to dismiss what you're saying. Okay. I agree, but I'm wondering in the grand scope of things if it's going to be that critical. Yeah, we would still monitor if there's one that's a um, maybe a sight line issue for traffic. Those ones that we would still uh, pay attention to and speak to the owner, but uh, certainly no enforcement action on that. Thank you. Any other comments from the council on this? If not, I will ask for a roll call, or excuse me, a vote by a show of no, is this a roll call? No, show of hands. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? None being? Passes 7 0. Next, <clears throat> excuse me, we have, order, we have ordinance 07 1019 This is a first reading. Uh, and the public hearing on this item will be held on November 2nd, 2020. This is amending Appendix A fee schedule for delegated review of traffic, stormwater, and site location of development permits as proposed by staff. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion from Councilor McLeod, a second from Councilor Carrier. I'm going to open this up to the public for comment. Is there anybody in the public that would like to comment on this first reading? None being. I'm going to bring this back to the Council. Council, debate, discussion, information's in your packet. I just want to say I think it's a great idea that we're staying well below the state uh, charges, but still allowing expeditious service to people who want to build and open businesses here, residents. Yeah, I just, uh, I'd like to say we, we did a site visit today for um, New Image Awning over on Merrow Road, corner of Merrow and Hotel, going through a tremendous growth. Um, nothing but positives about the city of Auburn, though they did mention that it would have been helpful on a, just a very weird sense. Um, they wanted, they got approval for a huge expansion and then decided after approval they wanted to expand even further. And that had to go through the entire process again, which took around 30 to 35 days. We can probably address that. It's a really good uh, site. But the point is, that 30 to 35 day window pushed him out of construction season. So it just delayed it by a few months on that expansion, which also delays the hiring of additional staff. Not the end of the world, but it's something to keep in mind that 30 days is a huge deal, especially in Maine with construction and seasonality. So, positive move. I think this is gonna be uh, blasted around the state in New England. It's the most business friendly city in uh, New England. Sounds good. Good tech. We'll work Liz on it. Okay, <laughs> very good. I'd like to ask for a vote. Um, or any other comment on this debate? None being? Show of hands. All those in favor? Uh, Point of order. Is this a roll call? <laughs> yes. Roll call. It's an ordinance. Oh, that, I'm sorry. You would have, yes, I just, my notes were wrong on that. Um, can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. 
Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Order passes unanimously, vote of 7 0. Fair enough. Tickets will buy. I'd like to open this up to the second open session of the night. Members of the public um, are invited to speak to the council about any issue directly related to city business, which is not on this agenda. Please, lay, uh, I'd ask you to say your name and address and limit your comments to three minutes. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak tonight? If so, just please go to the podium. I don't believe there are any. I'm going to close this. There are none. I'm going to close the second open session, and we're going to move on to reports. First report, Mayor's report. Um, it's been busy around the city of Auburn. I will say that uh, we are negotiating and I'm working with a lot of my peers, other mayors around the state, uh, the National League of Cities, as well as uh, the White House and the administration, specifically the Department of Intergovernmental Affairs and the governor's office, looking at how CARES money is being utilized, um, what additional pockets of money there are, uh, and the deadlines that are looming both at the state level and at the federal level and what those really mean. There will be lots of uh, last minute decisions, exemptions, modifications, and rollouts between now and uh, November, and specifically before December 20th. So I know city staff is on this. We're looking at it from a policy standpoint as well. I've had several businesses reach out to me directly for clarification on specific rules and how it would affect their Auburn business, please keep doing so. Reach out to me. I was in this one business's example. They reached out uh, the evening before. By 10 o'clock the next morning, I had answers from the governor's office that were good. Uh, so please keep reaching out and we will work our best to facilitate an answer for you. So that is my report. Uh, City Council reports. We're going to start off on the left and start off with Councilor Carrier. Airport had a board meeting uh, the first of. Uh the month and basically what it was a review is of uh, our business activity and what we're looking for in businesses, uh, future businesses for the airport area. Uh, several suggestions in regards uh, the hotel was brought up again, uh, truck yard, truck wash, uh, utilization of the space that's out there, trying to think of the best ways to turn the airport into a little bit more of a money maker uh, and be more self-sufficient. Uh, we're looking at that and uh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm hearing noises uh, and we went over that and just uh, getting some uh, ideas from the other board members uh, as far as the school committee uh, the real update that we got this uh, in the last two weeks has been that the second round of uh, CARES money has come out, uh, CRF2. Again, it had the criteria that we had to have the uh, money spent by December 31st, which limited us to what we could actually get in hand. Uh, so the, the end result was that the school committee bought all new computers for the high school which will give us all new computers all the way across the city now, uh, all grades. Uh, the second item, large item that we bought is uh, two of the buses were already in purchase. Uh, the bought, they have bought another two buses, uh, one of which we already have, the other one should be here this week. We bought five new vans, uh, utilizing the vans for food delivery and, and things was a little rough. Uh, so purchasing these new vans made it a little bit easier to get the food deliveries set up. One of the vans will be a cargo van, which will make it easier to pick up the old computers, which we will be turning around and uh, selling those. So uh, the, new bus, the new bus turn will be done, uh, started and be done by December 31st at, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, Washburn, Walton, Washburn, I think. Uh, and that was the other money that was spent. Uh, there was a little bit of money left over because the grant was actually more than the 2.9 originally that they had told us about, but uh, it looks that we will have all the money spent. Just a, a point of reference, if you sell the used laptops that you've replaced with new laptops that were funded through the CARES Act, the revenue that you gain from that sale has to go back to the federal government or be spent on an appropriate CARES Act item. 
if that isn't going to happen, I'd highly encourage maybe a, a well. We were we were talking. The discussion was that it, depending on when we're able to sell it back, is that we would buy further software uh, for the the kids. The uh, superintendent had looked at uh, software in uh, areas where our test scores have not been exactly what we'd like to see. So they're buying additional software that will improve those uh, test scores, okay. which it would be within the CARES Act. Very good. That's all. Councilor Gary? Nothing at this Councilor time. Uh, just that LATC met, and uh, they're in the process of refurbishing the bus station at Walmart and re-adding the bench that had been removed for safety concerns. Councilor Zimmer? Nothing. Councilor Milks? At the sewer trustee meeting is tomorrow, Tuesday, um, at AVCOG, 4 o'clock, 125 Manly Road. On Wednesday, the water district meeting has been moved to, it's going to be in the garage at the water district building because we were where we were going to do it was deemed inappropriate for separation of church and state or whatever. But there was some... Auburn Water owns churches too? I mean, you own everything oh, else. We were going to well. use a church for the meeting. Oh, okay. And some people objected. Oh, literally. So a we church. decided to move it back to the Auburn District, Water District. We're pulling the trucks out. We're setting up the uh, tables in the garage. Yeah. To Wednesday at 4, if you'd like to be there. It's going to be 58 degrees. It'll be fun. Councillor uh, <laughs> Walker? Yes. Uh, for the people that live in the area of Walton School, there's a meeting tomorrow night. I believe it starts at 6 o'clock, and it will have to do with the reconstruction of the front yard of that school. So if uh, you want to see the plan and how the buses may use a different route going in, going out of that schoolyard there, you might want to attend that school, especially if you live in that area, because you may not like what you see going on. 6 o'clock, Walton School. That's correct. Six o'clock. I just double checked it at six o'clock Walton School. Um, Councillor Boss. Well, I do have two different committees to provide updates for. Well, actually, for Auburn Public Library, we our next meeting is tomorrow morning, so I don't have any new updates to provide since our last council meeting. Um, but our ag committee is firing on all cylinders. We've got we've appointed a, an associate member seat. We still have one more open. We've created a logo. We're reviewing bylaws. Um, we have we're diving into the city council order with all, the list of seven different priorities that we wanted to address in COVID. Um, and we are starting a robust inventory of all commercial farm value added and fuel production in Auburn. So if you have businesses that you know of and purchase products from in Auburn, reach out to myself or anyone else on the committee. Um, we're also gonna be doing a, com a push in the community for the same information to make sure that we have a real understanding of all of the different products that are coming out of Auburn. <clears throat> Um, I'm also working on assessing food systems impacts from COVID and looking at projections. There are some great partners across the state who are already doing this work and reporting out. Um, and I've also, last month, I attended the main agriculture committee meeting, which is statewide partners um, look, who are all focused on growing the agricultural economy in Maine to make sure that we are connecting our local efforts to what's happening on a statewide level. So lots of good work happening there. Very good. Was that, did you have a second committee report? APL tomorrow morning, 7.30 a.m. Very good, thank you. Um, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, first, just thank you for the time that we took to present Peter with his award. Normally that's done at a uh, awards banquet with MTCMA, which was canceled as a result of COVID. So, um, so they've been going out and doing these individual presentations. So really appreciate the, uh, the team that came out and made that award presentation certainly peter's uh, very deserving of that as well as reagan young for her uh recognition as an intern with that award also came a scholarship i don't remember them saying that but a little scholarship fund uh, to actually help offset her college uh, tuition which was uh, very good um, i also want to thank uh, don buto who's the president and ceo of future guard the mayor made mention of this but what a great tour we had there uh, before the meeting um, as the mayor may have mentioned, uh, if you 
weren't able to attend that, uh, we will be going back out. Uh, he'd like us to come back out once things are, he has uh, more of his equipment, probably close to $5 million worth of equipment that will be uh, installed very soon um, and seeing more of that operation. But what a great uh, showcase for the city of Auburn for uh, one of our businesses. Um, the county budget uh, has a public hearing on Wednesday, October 21st. Uh, Councilor Walker and myself have been uh, sitting through the county budget uh, committee process. And so really encourage folks who want to be part of that to be there Wednesday, October 21st, 6 p.m. at the county building. Uh, there'll be a hearing and then we'll provide, uh, once we know what will be presented, uh, final, final presentation, I'll make sure I provide that to the council. Um, voting, uh, voting is um, moving <laughs> right along. Sue has done an outstanding job with her team. Um, the team tonight will turn this room back over into a voting location. This is where we're doing early voting. Um, we had uh, some challenges prior to. Council Walker uh, was part of that where he was in line for a long time. I'll just leave it at that. And it's just because our limited numbers that we're allowing into the building on the first floor. So moving uh, early voting up here on the second floor has really allowed people for the most part to walk right in and vote and leave. There's been very, very few um, have had to wait in line, uh, but the process has gone really well. It's a steady flow of people coming into the building um, all day uh, doing the early voting. Um, also, uh, folks, you know, if you're my, like my mailbox right now, um, this may have gotten lost uh, because there's so many um, political um, advertisements that are out there. But this flyer uh, went to all uh, Auburn residents. Um, if it's not to you yet, it will be coming uh, this week. Um, the first half of this was for uh, election information, the fact that we changed polling locations, where to go, um, and, and about early, um, requesting early or vote early or return early process. Um, the second half of this flyer was just regarding the mask up I'm trying to encourage folks to be mindful of uh, protecting uh, yourself and protecting others and businesses. So um, team did a great job on this flyer. This went out. Um, this was done through uh, some of the funding that we received through uh, either COVID or election funding. Uh, both of those grants um, came in. We're wrapping those up now. Um, and so once that's completed, I've asked staff to do a complete report for you uh, so that you'll have a, a good handle on what was purchased, why was it purchased, <coughs> and um, the items that were probably going to be coming up in a future CIP uh, so you can see how we've leveraged some of those dollars for future, um, future purchases that was um, probably slated for the city as far as some of our upgrades that needed to take place. Uh, hopefully you've seen our message boards that we have here on this building and also in New Auburn. Um, that's really there designed to encourage people regarding uh, any of the uh, COVID related alerts as well as um, really focusing on community events and, and also um, uh, voting uh, locations and times. We have extended hours as well. Uh, encourage folks to look at our website uh, for, the, for those hours. Um, but those extended hours will be helpful for folks who could not come in during the day for early voting. The, uh, Sue, can you just give those? Yeah, um, Saturday the 24th, we're gonna be open from nine until noon. Uh, Thursday the 29th, we'll be here until seven o'clock p.m. and Friday the 30th until five o'clock p.m. So additional options for folks to be able to come in I just want to remind the council of our council, um, your council retreat that is scheduled for October 24th at the Senior Community Center from 9 to 1. The agenda will be posted um, by Wednesday by the city clerk, so that will be out and available. Also would like to remind you regarding the charter review. We have additional special meetings for those October 26th and November 9th. Those will both be here at starting at 5 p.m. And um, I think that's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Sure. I will say that I do believe Auburn is going to be the capital, the North American capital of outdoor living, furniture, and equipment, thanks to uh, FutureGuard. So it's kind of nice to know. Um, 
if anybody is ever interested in working there, they're hiring about 130 people. So we're going to move on to reports. Jill Eastman, Finance Director Report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we're one quarter of the way through this fiscal year already. <laughs> Does it slow down ever? <laughs> um, and we're actually doing very well. Um, I, our total line is we're $689,558 on the city side ahead of where we were last year at this time. Um, the biggest part of that comes from excise tax and the homestead exemption. This year, as, as you heard earlier, we have more homestead exemptions this year than we've had ever. And instead of the $20,000, they're $25,000. And we're getting, I believe it's 70% or 72% uh, reimbursement Funded. from the state. So um, that's, that's from that. There's 400,000 more than we got last year. And we get it in, we get 75% of our reimbursement in the fall and then the other 25% in June. So um, the fall <laughs> is almost the whole, whole budget that I, that I actually budgeted, so, which I was surprised. Um, on, the, on the expense side, um, we are ahead of last year, but the, there's three main reasons for that. And one is I made the transfer to workers comp earlier than I have in the past. Um, I'm just trying to be proactive and stay ahead because I know budget's coming and just, and then the um, TIF transfers were made after, after the first payment and county tax was posted in September instead of October this year. Um, and debt service was high, is higher by 400,000 than it was last year. So, um, other than that, things are looking good and I am watching it all the time, so. You know you are. Thank you very much, Jill, for that. Just, I, I, I think it um, deserves just a couple minutes uh, more deep dive into homestead exemption. Because just to, for those of you who are watching at home and the council, um, I was active with the MMA and lobbying um, around a variety of different homestead exemption additions. This is what was final. But this, it was 20,000. It moved up to 25,000 which gives a blended rate, I believe it's 72 or 73% reimbursement because that $5,000 increase was reimbursed back to the city at 100%. What happens is the legislature can vote in and grant homestead exemptions, which is a property tax relief, however they see fit, but they do not have to reimburse the cities for the lack of revenue. Historically, they've only been reimbursing at around 60%. So what that does is it doesn't really truly give property tax relief. It just shifts the burden up. Um, so you have to make up that money. It is, with all due respect, maybe not that much due respect, it's a shell game. So when they increased the uh, homestead exemption, finally they reimbursed that increase at 100%. So what we found in the city of Auburn is while our mill rate did not go up, it did not go down because we had so many more people filing for homestead exemption. Instead of getting that money when taxes were due, we're now pushed off and we're going to get that, that, that um, reimbursement, or at least partial reimbursement, back later on the next fiscal year. So this all plays in. It causes a, if you would, a delayed impact. At least this is my interpretation, Jill. I want to hear your thought. Is a delayed impact on potential property tax relief from the state because of the increase in it and then the uh, delay in, in reimbursement back to the municipality? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure that I totally agree with you, but... Um, then again, we never really agree totally on anything. Do no, we, we don't. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's okay. But, but they, um, I mean, we do get the biggest portion of it, and normally we only get 50% of the taxes in September. So, you know, we're... That piece of it, we're at 100% of what I budgeted right now, almost. Mm -hmm. We're at like 98%. Um, and the property taxes are a little below what they were last year by $70,000 of where we were last year and where we are this year. So basically, so. the increase in valuation uh, that was offset by the increase in homestead exemption, we're going to see some of that revenue coming back this fiscal year. Yeah, we're going to yeah. get some of it. 
but um, because we and we do have more um, a more homestead exemptions though than we had. I would just add, Mr. Mayor, I did make mention at our last meeting when I was doing my city manager report regarding uh, main municipals associations, uh, focus areas uh, as, it, as it pertains to legislation moving forward. Uh, the mayor's right, that additional uh, $5,000 that was added, um, they did reimburse that 100%, but they did nothing to increase the original 20,000. That's the piece that we're still advocating for if um, the council, I mean, if the legislators make that move, then our push is that the legislators now focus on bringing that original $20,000 up to 100% reimbursement for cities and not um, at the rate that they're doing. So. That'd be true property tax relief. Correct. Okay. Any questions on finance? Councilor Kerr. I have a quick question uh, on the investment side of it. <clears throat> it said that we're going to earn less in interest uh, we're cu are currently earning 1.2 percent and we're going to decrease this year how much and I, you may not be able to answer this, how much money do we have in that and and what's our turnaround for it um i have cds that right now i have a million dollars in cds is all um because as i've sold off as they as they've matured i haven't bought anymore because i can get the same interest rate or even a little bit more here locally um, because it's dropped so much. But you can see that some of those were at like 1.75 and we're getting under 1% now. So um, I think I, that we, we've been at 1%, but Anders Goggins just dropped us to 0.85, which is probably more than a lot of places, but um, because the CDs were like 0.5. And I said, no, thank you. I'll just keep it here. So. Okay. Any other questions? Not being? Okay. Um, I'll turn a motion to accept and place on file the September 2020 monthly finance report. Moved. And uh, motion from Councillor Carrier, second from Councillor Walker. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Not being approved by a vote of 7 0 or unanimous. Uh, thank you very much. That's the last item on our agenda, other than executive session. We will come back after the executive session and adjourn. There will be no other business or action post this executive session. Um, next, an executive session uh, for labor negotiations pursuant to 1 MRSA section 405 6D. Do I have a motion? Hey. Second. Motion for Councilor Walker, second for Councilor Carrier. Um, as for Actually, all those in favor of entering into executive session, please raise your hand. Okay, we now stand in executive session by vote of 7-0. <laughs>